Day and GB News Live from 12 p.m. Only on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB Plus Digital Radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Weekday afternoons on GB News, we've got the whole of the UK covered. From 12 to 3, it's GB News Day with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Gloria Di Piero. You'll get the very latest on everything that's been going on across our great nation. And from 3 till 6, watch out for GB News Live with me, Patrick Christie. I'm not here to mess around with all the biggest topics and guests. You will always be up to date. GB News Day and GB News Live from 12 p.m. Only on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB Plus Digital Radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm, where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee, but we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11pm. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11pm, seven nights a week. Hello and a very warm welcome to GB Newsday with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Gloria DiPiero. We're with you till three. Our headlines this afternoon. A wave of missile attacks on Ukraine's major cities have killed at least eight people and injured many more. Britain's security minister, Tom Tugendhat, has accused the Russians of carrying out war crimes. We'll cross to Ukraine for the very latest as President Putin meets his war cabinet in St. Petersburg. Also coming up on the programme, another government U-turn. The Chancellor will now bring forward his tax and spending plans to Halloween. Having told GB News exclusively last week, it wouldn't be until November. He'll also be revealing the independent assessment of his figures. So has he been spooked by the markets or his own MPs? We'll have the latest from Westminster. And Just Stop oil protesters blocked the mall outside Buckingham Palace this morning. It's the latest in a series of demonstrations that have disrupted travel in the capital. We'll hear from one eco-campaigner and why they're stepping up their action. And, of course, we want to hear from uh, you about all the stories making their headlines today. Email, e email rather, with the thoughts uh, on gbnews at gbviews.uk. Your opinion is important. Before that, though, latest news headlines. Here's Rosie. Good afternoon. It's coming up to two minutes past 12. I'm Rosie Wright, keeping you up to date today on GB News. There's going to be an urgent meeting of G7 leaders tomorrow following the Russian airstrikes in Ukraine. Casualties are being reported across the country following explosions in several cities, including the capital. The British Foreign Secretary James Cleverly says firing missiles in civilian areas is unacceptable. Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky says 11 important infrastructure facilities in Kyiv and eight regions have been damaged. They want panic and chaos. They want to destroy our energy system. They are hopeless. The second target is people. Such as time, such goals were specifically chosen to cause as much damage as possible. But we are Ukrainians. We help each other. We believe in ourselves. 
we restore everything that is destroyed. Russia's President Vladimir Putin said it was right to retaliate after the Crimea blast. He accused Ukraine of a targeted attack at the weekend when a truck exploded, damaging a bridge. Putin warned if attacks continue against Russia, the response will be harsh. Peter Stano is a spokesperson for European foreign affairs and security policy. He says the EU condemns Russia's attacks. The Russia is um, opting for a tactic uh, with aiming and indiscriminately bombing the civilians. This is something which is inter against international humanitarian law and this indiscriminate targeting of civilians amounts to a war crime. The Chancellor is about to pressure to bring forward his much-anticipated medium-term fiscal plan. Last week, in an exclusive interview with GP News, the Chancellor said he was going to stick to the original date in mid-November. Today, though, in a letter to the Chairman of the Commons Treasury Committee, Kwasi Kwarteng said it will now be published on October the 31st. Well, the Liberal Democrats have accused the government of making a screeching U-turn, warning of a Halloween horror show unless there's a clear plan for the economy. The Prime Minister is going to urge MPs to work together as a united party as Parliament resumes this week. Liz Truss has now appointed Greg Hands as International Trade Minister, a move seen as an attempt to ease Tory tensions. Hands, who has sported Rishi Sunak during the leadership contest, replaces Connor Burns, who was sacked from his role on Friday following a misconduct complaint. The Work and Pensions Minister, Victoria Prentice, told GB News that the government right now is working towards stability. What's important to us, really, is that we provide that careful, sensible, calm government which the public need and deserve. I don't think people are interested in the interior workings of the Conservative Party. Scotland's First Minister is expected to tell SNP delegates that independence will lead to a better relationship between the UK's four nations. Nicola Sturgeon, who's due to close the party conference in Aberdeen this afternoon, will also accuse the UK government of denying Scottish democracy. Well, we'll bring you her speech live on GB News. The Supreme Court's going to rule if a prospective bill to hold another vote of independence is within the powers of Holyrood later this week. Criminal barristers in England and Wales have voted to end their strike action after accepting a pay offer from the government. The offer from the Ministry of Justice includes reforms to set fees for legal aid work and an investment of £54 million in the criminal bar. Almost 57% voted to accept the deal. Strike action will end at six tonight. And the chair of the Criminal Bar Association, Christy Brimlow, told GB News there's still a lot of anger, though, amongst the members. The offer really did hit the demands of the criminal bar. However, a number of barristers still consider that it hasn't gone far, far enough. There's still a lot of trust in government that has to be realised. And we hope that this is the start of a constructive arrangement. ScotRail's warning passengers of widespread travel disruption across its network today as strikes continue. It's members of the RMT who are staging a 24-hour walkout over their ongoing pay dispute. There'll only be a limited number of ScotRail services that will operate, and passengers have been urged to only travel if they really need to. The number of people crossing the channel in a single day has topped 1,000 for the fourth time in under two months. Ministry of Defence figures show over 1,000... And 50 people made the journey from France to the UK yesterday in 25 small boats. The latest crossings now bring the total number to over 34,700 people so far this year. You're now up to date on GB News and I'll bring you developments as they happen. Now let's head back to Mark and Gloria. Rosie, thanks very much indeed. Now, explosions have hit uh, major Ukrainian cities, including the capital, Kyiv, killing at least eight people and injuring another 24. Uh, but... Russia reportedly firing some 83 missiles at various targets across Ukraine. President Zelensky saying that Russia was trying to wipe his country off the face of the earth. Here, Security Minister Tom Tugendhat describing those attacks as a war crime. The attacks have come after the only bridge that connects Russia to Crimea partially exploded on Saturday morning. Ukraine has not so far admitted responsibility for the explosion, but President Putin has spoken in the last hour confirming the strikes that hit Ukraine this morning and has promised a harsh response to any other attacks on Russian territory. 
Well, uh, elsewhere, the leader of Belarus, Alexander Lukashenko, has already stated that Belarus and Russia are now to form a joint military group. Well, let's get the latest reaction from Ukraine itself. And uh, we can speak to Misha Babu, a journalist who's been in Ukraine since the war started. Uh, Misha, thank you very much indeed for speaking to us uh, again. Um, Putin has been speaking in St. Petersburg, saying he'd ordered these strikes on military communications and energy infrastructure. However, many of the pictures we're seeing are clearly showing civilian areas. Well, indeed, uh, I'm on the outskirts of Kiev right now, uh, just about two and a half, three hours away on my way to the capital city. And uh, what I can tell you is that there's a, there's a public outrage, there's a, there's a significant outrage uh, across Ukraine among civilians because um, they do see this as an attack on innocent people, whereas um, the strike in Crimea, they see it as a legitimate target on a bridge. Um, this, what happened this morning, literally shocked the Ukrainian society. Um, we've seen uh, a number of cars, civilian cars, what seems to be civilian cars, hit by um, these uh, rockets, by these missiles. And at the moment, we know that there are for sure uh, civilian casualties among Ukrainians in several cities uh, across Ukraine, including uh, women and children. So uh, it, it's it's something that uh, it shocked the Ukrainian society, but I cannot say that it wasn't expected to, to a certain degree. They they were bracing themselves for, for attacks, however, not at the scale and the impact on civilians as it happened this morning. And to, to be fair with you, uh, as it, it's still an ongoing situation, alarms are still going on across cities that I'm driving into right now um, towards, uh, towards capital city, Kiev. And, and Marsha, you, you mentioned the strike on the bridge. It's not just any bridge, it's a hugely symbolic bridge. Just explain um, why it's so important, why that bridge is so symbolic. Right. So this bridge has a, a, a logistic purpose. It, it was a, It's the lifeline to Crimea to bring goods in and out of Crimea to Russia. So it connected um, not only economically and, and logistically Russia to Crimea, but it also had a, a symbolic stand for, for Russia. Um, it was the first connection they, they built uh, at the time when it was um, opened in 2016, I believe, 2000, end of the 2016. And it was seen as a major victory, as a, as some sort of a uh, way to legitimize the annexation that happened the, early in 2014. So this bridge um, had a, a huge impact, not only economically and strategically, but also politically for Putin and for Moscow, saying, "Look, we got our foot in 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 Crimea. We're here to stay. We're not going to leave." People coming in and out of this. Uh, uh, region are now part of Russia. And w why is it, do you think, Mercia, that uh, Ukraine's not actually taken um, uh, recognition or accepted that they've um, launched this attack? Uh, clearly, President Putin has called it a terrorist act, but uh, is there an indication that this was a, a planned operation? Well, um, I'm not a military expert, obviously, but um, to, to cause this major disruption, you do need serious manpower, logistics and explosives. And this is what people are who are obviously more qualified and trained than I am as a journalist uh, are, are telling me. So uh, it looks like a state is behind this attack. Now, Ukraine and, and other, other states have this uh, policy of not always uh, taking credit for, for attacks. And it happened in the past, in the recent past, I would say, in um, other cities across um, the so-called uh, autonomous or separatist republics in eastern Ukraine when they hit uh, military targets, military leaders, and Ukraine did not claim responsibility for it. It did happen, if we remember, in uh, Moscow with the incident of um, Dugin's daughter, and uh, Ukraine never took responsibility for that, but uh, sources in the, in, in, in the um, American government did say you, some parts of the Ukrainian government uh, planned that failed um, uh, attack on on Dugin and, and ended ended up killing his daughter. So um, this happens a lot. This happens a lot in governments when there's a covert operation, not to take immediate uh, responsibility or claim credit for it. Um, but we did see. Uh, if you remember uh, two days ago, we did see uh, some some people from some members of the government taking credit for this attack or saying 
look, yeah. this is just the beginning. Jonathan. Yeah, yeah. Mitch, uh, thank you very much indeed for updating us once more from inside Ukraine. Thanks for your time and, and stay safe. Thank you very much indeed. The time is 12 minutes past 12. Prime Minister Liz Truss is set to launch a charm offensive on her own party to bring her MPs in her party together after division um, over, God, many things, but the latest <laughs> benefits uh, <laughs> and whether they should rise <laughs> with inflation. Well, in the latest government U-turn, uh, it appears the Chancellor Kwasi Kwarteng saying that he will now bring forward that statement on his tax plans to October the 31st. Halloween, despite having told GB News in an exclusive interview last week, the date would remain as November the 23rd. Well, joining us now is the Conservative MP for Amber Valley, Nigel Mills, who's also a member of the Work and Pensions Committee. And Nigel, we want to ask for your uh, position on, on benefits shortly. But first of all, your reaction to the bringing forward of not just the independent forecast, but also the what's called a medium-term fiscal plan. Let's call it what it is, a, you know, pretty much a budget. Yeah, I think it makes sense, doesn't it? And I think that the markets have been a bit unsettled, having not seen you know, how what the Chancellor announced uh, three weeks ago fits into the overall public finances. So I think it makes sense to see the comprehensive details on those before we get the next Bank of England uh, interest rate rise. I suppose we don't want them to do that blind and put interest rates up by more than they need to. So it makes sense to bring that forward. That's a good decision. Then why did he tell our business and economics editor, Liam Halligan, in our exclusive interview with him at the party conference that we were all reading the runes wrongly and it was November the 23rd? It's yet more evidence to many people, it seems, of chaos and confusion at the heart of government. Yeah, there always seems to be a thing that, you know, that, that things aren't decided until they're decided, even though everyone knows that they're about to be decided. So I, I, you know, I think you have to ask him why he said something different then. But, um, you know, it's, it, makes, it seems to make sense to me that you... I mean, in reality, we should have had all that information with the uh, mini budget two and a half weeks ago. That may well have been a better position to be in, to have the full fiscal impact of all the announcements set out. They probably aren't as bleak as some people thought they looked like. Um, so it, it makes sense to bring it forward. It's the right decision. You know, Parliament's back this week. It makes sense to have uh, announced that. I mean, perhaps we should have announced it tomorrow when Parliament's sitting rather than today, but it seems like a sensible thing to do. Uh, well, he has got Treasury questions to open Parliament tomorrow, so I'm sure he will uh, face uh, questions on that. Now, let's turn to uh, the next issue that Liz Truss um, and Kwasi Kwarteng really do have to take a decision on, and that is whether benefits, and you know a lot about benefits with the opposition on the Select Committee, should rise in line with prices, in line with inflation. What do you think? Yeah, of course they should. I mean, they've, uh, I mean, the idea of benefits is that we give people a certain decent standard of living, and for that to uh, continue, the money that you give them has to go up with the uh, in line with the cost of what they buy with that money. So, inflation is the right way to increase benefits, especially in a, a crisis like this. You, you know, the idea that people can live for the year from April twenty three through to the end of March twenty four. Uh, on less than an inflationary increase in this situation, I think it's just completely impossible. I can see why you, you know, simplistically, you might think, well, why put benefits up by a higher rate than earnings? Why don't that stop people wanting to go to work and make benefits, you know, worth more than, than working? But when you really think it through, the, you, you know, the idea with bills rising as they are, that people could actually manage on 5% less in real terms than they are now to get through the whole of the winter 23, 24 is just impossible. I, I, I I actually think the real question is, will we have to repeat all the help we've given people this year to get through the next winter? I think that's a much more live debate than this one, which I think will be resolved pretty quickly in the right way. Uh, we're told that Liz Truss is going to embark on a charm offensive. How does she do that? Well, I think it makes sense. You know, she's only been in, in post a month or so. Uh, Parliament's back this week. MPs will be there. She can she can meet us and explain what the government's plans are and how they're going to you know, hopefully not make the same mistakes in the coming weeks that they've made in the uh, first few of her of her reign. I mean, there have been some you know, quite right decisions. I mean, the huge energy support was much more generous than most people expected. That, you know, is perhaps 100 billion worth of announcement that appears to have got lost. Uh, so it hasn't all been bad, but I think there's a need just to, to get a grip and reassure people, and I hope that's what we get this week. Nadine Dorries uh, says, if there were an election tomorrow, the Conservatives would face disaster. The opinion polls are absolutely terrible. But actually, there's no opinion poll as good as knocking on doors, which is what you will do. Um, tell us, do the, does the doorstep response um, mirror 
what the polls are telling us. Yeah, I think people are a bit angry. They're a bit concerned about what's happened and all the you know all the media talk around things. You know, it's quite understandable. You know, we have a cost of living crisis with energy bills. We've got interest rates going up. People are understandably concerned and want to know what the government's going to do to fix these things. As I said a few minutes ago, you know, so Ireland is the government has announced a huge support for energy bills, capping them at you know, much lower than we all feared they would be. So there is you know, some reassurance we can give people. We just need now to have a you know a period of calm, sensible government where we can you know, let people know what's really happening, what the government's trying to do to help them. But you know, it, it hasn't been a great. Uh, two or three weeks and you know our support has, has dropped but hopefully we can sort that out as we uh, get back to London this week. Calm and sensible government. Nigel Mills thank you very much indeed for your time and uh, we'll see what emerges in the week ahead of course. Thank you very much indeed for that but let's just reflect that we were talking about Kwasi Kwarteng announcing that he's bringing forward that medium term fiscal plan and the accompanying OBR forecast to Halloween 31st of October. And for some MPs, this latest U-turn is the right one, with the chairman of the Treasury Select Committee, Conservative Mel Stride, tweeting that he strongly welcome this decision, which might, hope is, result in smaller rises in interest rates. But remember that announcement coming just five days after the Chancellor had insisted it was the 23rd of November and would remain all that in the exclusive interview he gave at the Conservative Party conference to our economics and business editor, Liam Halligan. You are going to bring forward the fiscal assessment uh, in conjunction with the Office of Budget Responsibility. Said you said that. in your speech yesterday that will happen shortly. Is shortly before the 23rd? So shortly is the 23rd. I mean, uh, people reading the ruins and parsing. So it work. is going to be the 23rd of November. The, 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 you're, the, you're not bringing that fiscal it's, it's, it's plan gonna be, it, It's going to be the 23rd of November. Okay. 23rd of November oh, until it becomes 31st of October, which is Halloween, just by... So, uh, has he been spooked by the markets or his own MPs? I think it's largely a, a political thing. I mean, we should never forget um, that Mel Stride, a very competent chair of the Treasury Select Committee, um, Tory MP, was, of course, Rishi Sunak's campaign manager, so I think there's a bit of mischief <laughs> just a bit. going on here. Look, what's actually happening here is that there's a long-term rise in interest rates. All this political drama and shenanigans, it hasn't really affected borrowing costs today on what we call the 10-year gilt market, where the government borrows money. That rate sets the benchmark for where mortgage holders borrow money, where the interest rates on your personal loans and so on. This is aside from the Bank of England. The Bank of England is now following the markets. The markets decide how much we all pay to borrow when we're taking on new loans. And today, that rate has continued to creep up, pretty much in line with the trend where it's been creeping up by tiny increments for the last three or four weeks. What is actually happening here is a long-term shift in the global interest rate cycle as we retreat from over a decade of ultra-low rates, over a decade of massive money printing across the Western world and parts of Asia too. That's what's actually happening. But Liam, how could the Chancellor say one thing to you on television last week and uh, uh, is it, it's not even a week later, mm. how, how say a a, take a, a different yeah. position? But what sort of effect does that have on the stability of how people view our economy and, and, and the handling of that economy? It certainly points to a lack of grip, absolutely, and the markets don't like that. Uh, and in the end, that could lead to slightly higher interest rates. But it's not as if this, you know, this is the this is the spark. It's not the cause of it's not the underlying trend and shift that's happening. The underlying trend and shift that's happening is happening across the world. Interest rates are going up everywhere. Interest rates in the States, the US are much higher than here. And that's one reason why the pound is falling, because if you put money in dollars, you get more of a return. But I completely agree with you, Gloria. It's not ideal. It's a long way from ideal when an incoming chancellor, an incoming prime minister are clearly being buffeted and pushed around, not least by members of their own party. Mm. And, and how significant is it that the bank, the Monetary Policy Committee, is meeting three days later, what, November the 3rd? Bearing in mind, we are now getting that OBR report as well. They're running the slide rule over it. Does that mean that the bank then can have a, a, a look at maybe how hard do we put the brakes on if they get some new figures from the OBR? Exactly right. This has been choreographed to come before the Bank of England's next Monetary Policy Committee meeting. These are the nine... Economists, including the governor, who are independent from 
uh, government, they set interest rates. You don't have politicians setting interest rates. You know, the Bank of England's base rate because they would always juice up the market. They wouldn't take a long-term view uh, uh, and, and so on. The real irony here, a lot of the Chancellor's issue is that the Bank of England only meets sort of eight or nine times a year. There are some months when it doesn't meet. It doesn't generally meet in January and it doesn't generally meet in October. If there had been a meeting in early October yeah. this last mm. week, it really would have calmed the markets. Mm. And I have to say, yes, the government's shown a lack of grip. I've, I've on record saying many, many times, I think, cutting the top rate of tax at a time like this in the middle of the cost of living crisis. Politically tin Eared. But also remember that the Bank of England was expected to raise interest rates by a lot more just before that mini budget. Yeah, yeah. So I think there's a, there's a lack of grip across our policy making establishment, I have to say. But you know, the longer term trend, we can't stress it enough, is that interest rates gradually, slowly but surely are going up. Not great if you've got a variable rate mortgage or a personal loan, but if you're a saver, yeah, yeah. you haven't got a return on your savings you know, for 10 plus years then this isn't all bad news. Yeah, and, and very quickly, the snapshot of the markets, has there been much reaction to this? Not really, no. Mm -hmm. No, as I said, borrowing costs have mm -hmm. just continued to, to, to creep up. I mean, I think I talk to lots of people in the market, currency traders and so on, they just think it's a political circus, like a Tory psychodrama, but <laughs> it doesn't really add up to a hill of beans in terms of the actual amount of money that the government is going to spend. Right. Cheers, Liam. Yeah, thank you very Speak much. Speak to you later in the show and throughout the show. Uh, coming up, we'll be heading to Aberdeen to get the latest from the SNP party conference with our political editor, Darren McCaffrey, ahead of Nicola Sturgeon's speech at 3.15 today. That's after this short break. Weekday afternoons on GB News, we've got the whole of the UK covered. From 12 to 3, it's GB News Day with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Gloria Di Piero. You'll get the very latest on everything that's been going on across our great nation. And from 3 till 6, watch out for GB News Live with me, Patrick Christie's. I'm not here to mess around with all the biggest topics and guests. You will always be up to date. GB News Day and GB News Live from 12pm. Only on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB Plus Digital Radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm, where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee, but we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11pm. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11pm, seven nights a week. Welcome back to GB Newsday. Quick bit of breaking news coming in uh, where the government says it's imposing sanctions on many senior figures from the Iranian regime amidst these protests over the uh, accusations of human rights violations and repression of women and girls. Uh, James Cleverly, the Foreign Secretary, saying uh, UK stands with the people of Iran. Sanctions are sending a clear message to the authorities. We will hold you to account for your repression of women and girls and for the shocking violence you've inflicted on your own people. Uh, we're learning that those sanctions are being imposed on the entirety of the so-called morality police uh, in Tehran, as well as uh, several other five leading political and security officials for committing serious human rights violations. That's just coming in from the Foreign Office. Now, 
to Aberdeen, where the Scottish Nationalist Party conference is in its third and final day. The First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, has said that the government, UK government should be clamouring for another independence vote if it is confident of winning. Well, Nicola Sturgeon also saying that the Supreme Court will fail the people of Scotland if it does not allow uh, to legislate for that second independence referendum. She's expected to give her keynote speech at 3.15. You can watch it live here on GB News. But right now... Now let's go to Aberdeen yeah. and speak to our political editor, Darren McCaffrey. Uh, Darren, so over the weekend, yesterday, in fact, she, Nicola Sturgeon told us that she detests Tories. What's she going to say this afternoon? Yeah, good question. Despite a bit of controversy that yesterday, didn't it? Uh, some Conservatives thought it went too far. It was kind of too provocative in terms of the language used. Dangerous, I think, was one word that a senior Conservative used to describe that. Nicola Sturgeon had a slightly rollback, a little bit, suggesting she was talking about Conservative Party policies rather than actual toys uh, themselves, and also saying it shouldn't come as a surprise that she's not the world's biggest fan of the Conservative Party. Uh, today, though, I think two things. First of all, there is going to be continued emphasis on independence and Scotland's place inside the Union. I mean, it is interesting having come, uh, as you were there as well, Gloria, at Labour and Conservative Party conference, where the narrative is the cost of living crisis, energy security, for the Conservative Party, lots of infighting here. I mean, it really is still dominated by that big constitutional question about Scottish independence and the attempts to hold a second referendum. As you've alluded to there, the Supreme Court tomorrow are going to begin hearings into essentially whether it is up to SMP, M MSP, sorry, in Holyrood or MPs in Westminster who has got the ultimate say on if and when a second referendum should happen. In all likelihood, in all likelihood, it's likely that the Supreme Court will rule in Westminster's favour. That means no referendum effectively, even though Nicola Sturgeon has stated she'd like one in October next year. And I think the big question then is, what does she do next? She's talked about trying to turn the 2024 general election into a de facto referendum, though, in the end of the day, that's constitutionally not really going to work. I've talked to some people here who suggest it's just political posturing in many ways to keep the SNP relevant in that general election campaign, particularly as support for Labour here has surged somewhat in the last couple of weeks. But also, there are lots of frustrations outside of this conference centre and across Scotland that think that Nicola Sturton shouldn't just be talking about Scottish independence but actually focusing a hell of a lot more on these day-to-day -day big political issues like the health service which is in a pretty dire state heading into you know the winter standards in schools where there's a mixed picture to say the best for the SNP in terms of how they've handled the education system and obviously the cost of living crisis and energy security too and I do suspect actually that Nicola Sturgeon will spend a lot of the speech talking about Scottish independence a lot of the speech attacking the Conservative Party in their uh, inability it seems at the moment to manage the economy well but also will be drawn into trying to talk about what more the SNP can do in Hollywood to manage the cost of living crisis here in Scotland specifically and also uh, frankly Scotland's future in terms of renewable energy because they are opening these enormous offshore wind farms that should actually generate a hell of a lot of electricity in the years uh, to come. But at the end, what you find here, frankly, as an outsider's point of view, if you like, when you come to SNP conference, is what you find elsewhere in the UK as well, is that you know all the achievements that have come in Scotland in recent years have all been the SNBs and all the failures are Westminster's. And that narrative certainly has not changed this weekend. And, Darren, very quickly, John Swinney is not going to be releasing his uh, plan for economic independence, i.e. how do they pay for themselves as an independent country, until after this conference. What do we make of that? Yeah, indeed, there's lots of questions, clearly, about what the SNP would do in terms of the pounds and rejoining the EU, whether that means joining the euro and... Bank of England independence and all that sort of stuff, all those questions we had back in 2014. The SNP in some ways felt they almost released too much information during that first referendum, that they, there's enormous policy documents that people could go through. I think for the SNP, they are trying to thread a bit more carefully, get the steps in order. I say this is you know, a very, very long drawn out process. All I would add is on the immediate budget, and there is going to be a budget here in Scotland in December, we're going to get more details, particularly on taxation, because the Scottish Parliament has got tax varying powers here in whether they will, for example, implement that lower rate tax cuts 
uh, that the government of Westminster has promised. Will that happen in Scotland? That will be an interesting question. But second of all, I think it's just this continued frustration from everyone, weirdly, in this debate about the future for Scotland. I mean, there's frustration here in the SNP about another second referendum. They think they've got a mandate from the Hollywood elections last year, which they won again. Uh, many argue they do have that mandate for a second referendum, so they're frustrated to have one. And then also there's frustration for people who don't want to have a referendum who say we should move on from all of this. It's a distraction. So Scotland massively divided and frankly massively frustrated too. Darren, we'll speak to you later in the show in the run-up to Nicola Sturgeon's speech. Thanks for now. After the break, as prices remain high, the government faces mounting pressure to increase benefits in line with those high prices. After your news with Rosie. Good afternoon, 12.32. I'm Rosie Wright, keeping you up to date on GB News. An urgent meeting of G7 leaders is going to be held tomorrow following the Russian airstrikes in Ukraine. Authorities say at least 10 people were killed and 60 injured as explosions hit several cities, including the capital. Ukraine's President Vladimir Zelensky says 11 important infrastructure facilities in Kyiv and eight regions have been damaged. Russia's President Vladimir Putin said it was right to retaliate after the Crimea blast. He accused Ukraine of a targeted attack at the weekend when a truck exploded, damaging a bridge. Putin warned if the attacks continue against Russia, the response will be harsh. In other news now, the Chancellor has bowed to pressure to bring forward his much-anticipated medium-term fiscal plan. Now, last week, in an exclusive interview with GB News, Kwasi Kwarteng said he was going to stick with the original date in mid-November. Today, in a letter to the chairman of the Commons Treasury Committee, he now says it will be published on October the 31st. Scotland's First Minister is expected to tell SNP delegates that independence will lead to a better relationship between the UK's four nations. Nicola Sturgeon, who's due to close the party conference in Aberdeen, will also accuse the UK government of denying Scottish democracy. You can hear that speech live here on GB News after three o'clock this afternoon. The King has sent a message of condolence to the President of Ireland following the death of 10 people in Friday's petrol station explosion in County Donegal. He said both he and the Queen Consort have been filled with immense sadness. They offered their heartfelt sympathy to those affected in what he described as a devastating tragedy. We're on your TV, online and DAB Plus Radio. This is GB News. Don't get anywhere. Mark and Gloria will be back in a moment. Weekday afternoons on GB News, we've got the whole of the UK covered. From 12 to 3, it's GB News Day with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Gloria De Piero. You'll get the very latest on everything that's been going on across our great nation. And from 3 till 6, watch out for GB News Live with me, Patrick Christie's. I'm not here to mess around with all the biggest topics and guests. You will always be up to date. GB News Day and GB News Live from 12 p.m. Only on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB Plus Digital Radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness, me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm, where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee, but we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11pm. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11pm, seven nights a week.
Welcome back to GB Newsday. Now, the Labour Party calling on the government to take a decision sooner rather than later to increase benefits in line with inflation and reverse what it called the government's kamikaze budget. Well, joining us now is Jonathan Ashworth, Shadow Work and Pensions Secretary. Uh, Jonathan, good to see you. Do the Labour Party believe that benefits should rise in line with prices? If so, how would it be paid for? Yes, we do believe that. And actually, this cabinet believed that until, or many of the members of this cabinet believed that, and certainly that's what they were saying a few months ago. Liz Truss and Kwasi Kwarteng sat in that cabinet. Indeed, Theresa Coffey was the Work and Pensions Secretary a few months ago when the government committed to rise to raise uh, benefits in line with inflation. She's now the Deputy Prime Minister. Look, look at the context we are in. We had a disastrous budget which led to turmoil on the markets. It led to a spike in borrowing costs, a run on pension funds. It, because of gilt yields and swap rates, mortgages have risen, costing people hundreds of pounds more. And now the government expect working mums and dads, disabled people, poorer pensioners to pay the price. We believe that is obscene. Those who rely on these social security payments should have the security of knowing that they will rise in line with the cost of living next year. And Tory ministers should stick to the promise that they made to their disabled constituents, to working mums and dads and pensioners in their constituencies. To make the numbers work, what would a Labour government tax to pay for such an increase in line with inflation? Well, you asked me to make the numbers work. It was, the, it was this government's previous chancellor who said they were committed to inflation rating social, secu social security payments next year. And that was only a few months ago before the summer. So why are the government now saying the numbers don't work? Well, the reason they're saying that is because they've just embarked upon a quite disastrous budget with umpteen tax giveaways, which led to absolute turmoil on the markets, which means that yeah. people are now facing mortgage increases well, that, that, of that, hundreds, that's... hundreds of pounds a month. So yeah. you ask me how it will pay for it. Well, well government is about choices. And this, is a cho this government has chosen to give tax breaks to big corporations, costing something like £17, £17 billion. Pounds. It's chosen to give... Uh, VAT free shopping to those tourists who go and shop in Harrods, for example. You know, I don't think they're the right choices to be making when disabled people who have higher energy bills, often because of the the, the costs involved in charging a, a wheelchair yeah. or a ventilator or higher heating bills, are facing a real crisis. Yeah, that, that the point I was trying to make is that clearly we're going to get the OBR's assessment of the spending plans. I mean, forty-three billion in unfunded tax cuts we're, we're estimating at the moment. But there is a question as to what Labour would tax to actually pay for these things, because the windfall tax is not going to cover all these things, is it? Well, we propose a windfall tax to contribute to, uh, to uh, freezing people's energy bills, and we propose a windfall tax. Remember, on those big gas and oil producers who have made monumental profits because of what's happening on the international energy markets. We've also suggested that the corporation tax breaks, which the government have gone ahead with, they shouldn't have gone ahead with that. As I, as I said, I'm not sure that tourists at this moment need a VAT uh, uh, cut so they can go shopping in, uh, uh, in well-to-do shops in, uh, in London, etc. So there's different choices that can be made. But fundamentally, it was this government who promised working mums and dads, disabled people, poorer pensioners, that their uh, social security payments would be inflation proofed. And it was only a few months ago that they made that promise. Tory ministers should honour that promise. Just looking at the opinion polls, uh, you know, 30 point leads, Nadine Dorries saying that uh, the government would face wipeout if there's an election tomorrow. But I'm skeptical about leads like 30 points. They just don't feel instinctively right. Uh, to me, how important is it that Labour do not fall into the trap of complacency? Well, I mean, you, you, you're right to be sceptical because, I mean, this is sort of a sort of politician cliche, but it's true. The only poll that counts is the one on <laughs> election day. I do think there's a yearning for change in the country. We've had 12 years of the Conservatives now, and I, I do think people want to go in a different direction. I sense that when I meet people. And people are terrified about these huge increases in mortgage rates which are coming now as a result of the budget which created this turmoil on the market with gilt yields rising, which has impacted on uh, mortgage brokers withdrawing deals, mortgage offers and putting more expensive offers on the table. So people are really, really worried. But the low party must not be complacent. We take nothing for granted and we know we have to work really, really hard to win the trust and gain the permission of the British people to form a government. 
Jonathan Ashworth, Shadow Work and Pension Secretary, thanks for your time today. Thank you. Thanks very much. Now, environmental activists uh, again uh, staging protests in central London this morning. Around 25 Just Stop Oil protesters blocking off the Mall in front of Buckingham Palace. They glued their hands to each other and to the road before eventually being moved off by police. The disruption lasted just over two hours, but police managed to clear the road in time for the changing of the guard procession. The protesters... Uh, this comes after Animal Rebellion held protests at the weekend calling for a plant-based future. But aside from causing disruption, what are the protests really achieving? Well, we're joined now in the studio by Nathan McGovern, spokesperson for Animal Rebellion. Nathan, thanks very much for joining us. First of all, just to explain to viewers and listeners, what is Animal Rebellion in a, in a nutshell? So first, yeah, pleasure to be joining you today, Gloria and Mark. Uh, really important that we have these discussions. So Animal Rebellion is just a group of really, really concerned people from all across the country who see what the science, you know, what Oxford and Harvard universities are telling us about solutions to the climate crisis and are pushing for the government to implement them. It's as simple as that. So but what about the tactics? It, yeah. It's the tactics it's, it's that, that people... It's direct action, that isn't it? Yeah. Probably lots of people have sympathy with your arguments. It's the tactics you employ. No, yeah, I really do understand that. And, you know, what I would say to that is, you know, we've, we've sent letters, we've signed petitions, you know, we've talked to our MPs, we've done all, you know, those proper ways, you know, you're meant to communicate. And yet nothing changes. So when we look back at history, we look at the history of non-violent direct action, the suffragettes, the civil rights movement, the Indian independence movement. We see this is how you know, drastic social and political change is made in the short time frame that we have with the climate emergency. Do you share then organisational uh, details or uh, other things with Extinction Rebellion, uh, Stop Oil Rebellion and so on? There are a plethora of groups, but you seem to be adopting the same sort of approach. Um, so, yeah, there are many groups, you know, built up, as I say, of just concerned people who are using similar tactics because, you know, we're all seeing that this is, you know, what we need to do to achieve the changes that we need right now. And I absolutely do support the actions of Extinction Rebellion and Just Stop Oil. I see that they are pushing for a better world, a better future for everyone, just as Animal Rebellion is. You sound like a kind-hearted chap. So if you were blocking the road... You see an ambulance coming or a mum with, with a child who needs to get to a doctor in a car. You'd move, right? Um, so what I'd say is, you know, if you saw from Just Stop Oil, I believe it's two to three days ago, they actually let an ambulance through. You know, you, you must have seen that yourself. So there is a blue light policy absolutely for emergency vehicles. You know, I would like to, you know, take this opportunity to personally apologise for the inconvenience and disruption to ordinary people's lives. You know, it isn't something that is taken lightly as a decision. And as I say, you know, we've tried all the so-called proper means of, of communication. I mean, we can see from some of these pictures there is growing frustration among some travellers with uh, this direct action. And is, is part of the problem, if you super glue your hands to the road or to each other, it's very difficult then to adopt a, a blue light policy. You physically can't get through that, that cordon of people that's demonstrating. Um, so what would happen is there would be some protesters or activists who wouldn't glue their hands to the road so they could move for an ambulance to make their way through. That is, you know, solidly built... Well, like a gateway. Strategy. Yes, exactly. OK. And just on looking at Twitter this morning, Just Stop Oil uh, said this, this is the moment to come together and resist. We are going to stop new oil, whether those in power agree or not. We are not asking, we are going to make it happen. Now, the government are elected <laughs> and the protesters are not, so... You, we live in a democracy, right? Uh, well, you know, you say that, but more members of the Royal Mail voted to go on strike than Tory party members voted for the Prime Minister who supposedly represents us all. You know, Pretty Patel, it got revealed, took an £100,000 donation from an oil baron, the biggest donor to Liz Truss's campaign was the wife of an oil baron. You know, when we say we live in a democracy, you have to look, who is donating to these political parties? Who's okay, well, who's thing? voting for them? Well, that's the people. <laughs> is, yeah, is there a danger that you're going to fall into that elephant trap that Liz Truss has built as an anti-growth coalition <laughs> that you're going to be tarred as, as the usual suspects? Well, first of all, I would say thank you to Liz Truss for giving us the time of day in the conversation, you know, this really critical conversation that does need to be had about the climate and ecological emergencies. And, you know, what I'd say is it shows that, you know, those who are in power know what needs to be done, but they're scared of it, right? They're scared that it's going to affect their lives, their personal interests, right? Rather than, you know, the people that they are supposed to be representing. 
What well, next for your protest? What, yeah. what do you next have planned? Is it the capital? Is it other parts of the country? Just, just tell us what people uh, can expect from your plans. So uh, Just Stop Oil, you know, I'm speaking for Animal Rebellion, but Just Stop Oil do plan to be taking action for the rest of this month to put pressure on this government to act in the best interest of the people. And as for Animal Rebellion, we will continue to be taking action, you know, whether that's in the capital or not. That's for, you know, other people to know and you to find out in but the it, near uh, future. But from what you're saying, it's like some sort of guerrilla tactics, is that right? You, you hit these different places at different times? Well, you say guerrilla, that makes it sound very, very military, but these are people... Well, you're pretty well organised, it seems. <laughs> these are people who are willing to put their faces and their names out there. They're willing to take accountability for their actions because they know they're doing the right thing. They know they're pushing for the right things. And, and can I ask, are you all young? Are you students? Are you a, a, a certain cohort of people? <laughs> oh, yeah, well, we couldn't get one of our middle-class spokespeople on from today, so you've got me from Coventry speaking to you right. today. Oh, you don't sound like you're from Coventry, no. <laughs> oh, no, I don't, I don't have the Coventry accent, do I? But so, no, there but, are people from all walks of life. Are there really? Because nurses, I, used to be, I used to sort of represent a constituency in the former coalfields mm -hmm. of, of, of Nottinghamshire. Are there any non-students in your organisation? I just, it just wasn't, I can't imagine any, not exclusively, but in the main, I'm assuming this is largely student-based, university, student-based um, organisation. No, I'd say it's people from all walks of life. It's engineers, doctors, nurses, publishers, people who are teachers and have given up their teaching profession because... The any, factory, any factory workers in there? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and, you know, there's, there's teachers who have given up their teaching profession because... The Supermarket workers? ...don't have a future. Yep, absolutely. And, you know, yeah, as I, you know, say, it's people from all walks of life, people who we've been talking to. You know, during the dairy blockade in, in September, there was a group led by co-founder Dan Kidby talking to farmers, much like you did yeah. in 2012, what's, Gloria. What's, what's your talking personal about reaction problems. to the, when, when we see some milk being um, tipped out on the floor in, in Fortnum and Mason, which is, 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 you know, a bit distressing for some people when they're doing their shopping. I mean, do we have to take that on the chin and, and allow you to take on those sorts of things? Well, you know, I would say, you know, it could be shocking to people, but what it's got going is this really critical discussion about, you know, the solutions to the climate crisis. You know, a plant-based future is a critical part of that solution. Nathan, thanks very much indeed uh, for coming in. We'll let you get back to Coventry by whatever <laughs> form of transport is green enough, but thanks very much for Thank your time here with us today. Thank, Thank you. you. Your views on the politics of the day now. Daryl says on benefits, if the government raises benefits by the same rate as inflation, surely they need to give nurses, doctors, police, firemen, all public employees the same pay rise. If not, they're saying it's OK for public workers to take a pay cut. Uh, Norma now on the question of another Scottish independence referendum. I felt the first one should never have just been about Scotland. Any result would affect the whole of the union. And I still feel the same way today. All the members of the union should have a say if there uh, is ever a referendum. That's an interesting point, actually. And Andy on Ukraine says, I believe that the surest way to end this war is for the Russian people to call their men to go home. They know that they are dying in Ukraine. They know that Putin cares nothing for the cannon fodder, for the words fail me. I've stood on the Kiev pedestrian bridge many times. Yes, it's the one we saw blown up in those uh, latest attacks. And uh, we're uh, just uh, getting an update. Ten people, at least ten people killed, 60 others wounded. Some of those strikes ongoing. We'll keep you updated on that, of course. Now, today is World Mental Health Day to help raise awareness. According to the charity Mind, roughly 40% of all GP appointments relate to mental health problems, and the pandemic has only increased the problem. So, well, no time to wait, uh, sorry, is a campaign aiming to place at least one mental health nurse in every GP surgery across the country, uh, ending what they call as the postcode lottery in mental health services and reduce current waiting time targets. James Starkey is the lead campaigner of No Time uh, to Wait. How far have we come? It's, it's World, World Mental Health Day today. Is it, is it important to recognise that it is much easier to have conversations like this than it was, for example, 20 years ago? I think, thank you, thanks again for having me on. You're welcome. Um, I, yeah, I think that's absolutely correct. I think things have really changed. I did a couple of events at the conferences in the last two weeks and we were reflecting on, I think, the Stephen Fry documentary, if people remember that, for me mm. was a bit of a watershed. And post that, we've had people like Prince Harry. And I think those role models have really made a difference in terms of how people now feel comfortable to talk to friends, family, and even in the office. Is the very nature of the problem, though, um, I'm just reading, and, and our heart goes out to him, the former Chancellor Shadi Javid talking about his brother's suicide. We just didn't see it coming. 
um, saying that the family was stunned by his brother Tariq's death back in 2018. One day he was there, the next he was gone. That you, know, you don't pick up warning signs sometimes until it's actually too late. It's true. I think um, Saj has, has spoken before very movingly about it. Mm. And as health secretary, I think it was one of his real top priorities. And I think one of the big issues is we still don't treat, um, even in the NHS, mental health with the same parity as physical health. We're not, we're not there yet. And is that because you know, a physical ailment is very visual, but hmm. something going on in someone's head can, can stay in there? Is, is that literally the problem? I think that's a big challenge. And I think also in terms of the way that we deal with things with kind of waiting times and lists, you know, you understand that if you have a broken leg, you have an X-ray, you have an operation, and then you start recovery. With mental health, it's different. You can have ups and I went back to the GP only four weeks ago and to ask for some, some more help. I still haven't heard back from them because... You really? Know, a month yeah, later. A month later My on goodness. the IAPT thing again, which is obviously what the campaign is on, is trying to improve that. Um, in GPs, but I think Sajid said himself in the article today, and one of the stats I think he found when he was in the health department was two thirds of people who go on to commit suicide don't come into contact with anybody at all. Yeah, yeah. In the and, mental health. and you were working at the heart of government. You were a special advisor to some senior government ministers. Isn't it frustrating for you, because you are clearly very passionate about this, you have been on this channel many times to talk about it, you've spoke openly about your own experience. Your government has been in power for 12 years. It's not enough, is it? It's not good enough, the, the progress that they have made on um, mental health services. It's gone backwards. I think more definitely needs to be done. Uh, we've got upcoming, there should be the suicide prevention plan coming up that I know Sajid was working on previously and will now be up to the new health secretary to Coffee. You know, that, that's a big opportunity. As you said yourself, even in the NHS, I apt that was kind of laid down towards the end of the last Labour government, uh, but was, you know, had been reformed um, under the coalition, had, was a massive step forward in terms of treatment with talking therapies on the NHS. But that's now close to 14 years ago. Mm. So that they did have a very, I think they had two consecutive kind of strong five-year plans. We did see improvement in terms of how people were treated. But I think we're at that stage now where we need to take things on further. Um, which is things like uh, mental health nurses and GPs and also seeing that strong suicide prevention plan. One of the biggest issues is bringing people together, you know, cross-government. As that two-thirds number states, there were people in contact with other agencies in government where maybe that's not getting through and they're not getting the help that they need. And, and how useful is it that senior figures outside of government, such as the Prince of Wales as he is now, William, um, put these things into the public arena and get people talking about it? I think it's absolutely crucial. Those leadership roles, they really have raised the awareness. Mm. And let's be honest, they put the pressure on the politicians to do something. Mm. When people like that speak, that, that causes the demand that the politicians have to come back and start uh, to do, do something. something. And anyone who's yeah. watching who is feeling depressed, who knows it's not just having a bad day, mm. they'll be alarmed, actually, by you saying you went a month ago. Can we give them some words of comfort that it is worth going if you are, if you are anxious about the state of your mental health, mm. then... You, you will get help, ultimately? There is help out there. And I think the most... What I would say to anybody is the most difficult thing is to ask for help. Yeah. Whatever situation you're in, whatever background you're from, um, it doesn't matter. None of us like asking for help. For me, it, I felt like I'd failed. Like if I and is that the, the admitting that to yourself before yeah. you then take the next step? I think even admitting to yourself that you need to reach out to somebody else and ask for help is a really, really hard thing to do. Mm. But there are people out there. You can call the Samaritans at any time. You can speak to friends and families. GPs do take this seriously. They will listen to you. And if you need help urgently, it really is out there. We love talking to you about this. So you're a very passionate campaigner and it comes across in all our exchanges. Thank you, James. Thanks, Thanks for thank coming you. Thank you. Lots more to come with me and Mark, and including an interview with former president of Ukraine, Petro Poroshenko. Yes, before that, though, let's get the weather details. Hello again, I'm Aidan McGiven from the Met Office. It's a fine day for most of us, sunny skies for many, especially for England and Wales, but it will be windy for Scotland in particular, with quite frequent showers here. That's where an area of low pressure resides, just to the north of Scotland. Tight isobars there bringing some strong winds, especially into the far north. 
but a cold front that has brought some rain earlier in the day. Well, that's now clearing and the last of the cloud clears away from Kent as we head into the afternoon as well. So brighter skies there for much of England and Wales. The odd shower for northwest England, perhaps north Wales as well. But the lion's share of showers will be across northern and western Scotland. A few for the north of Northern Ireland as well. Cloudier skies here and that brisk breeze making it feel cool. 11 to 13 Celsius for Scotland and Northern Ireland, but 14 to 17 for England and Wales where we see those bright blue skies. Heading into the evening and with light winds and clear skies for much of England, Wales, southern and eastern Scotland, well, we'll see temperatures fall away. The odd mist patch form, but uh, for most it's a clear night. Cloudier conditions for the north and west of Scotland as well as Northern Ireland and showers continuing here, although fewer compared with the daytime. So 7 or 8 Celsius in the northwest, whilst uh, low single figures are possible across sheltered parts of England and Wales, even a touch of air frost in one or two spots. So cold start to the day for England, Wales, uh, perhaps parts of eastern Scotland, but bright skies. Into the afternoon, I think the cloud will build for Scotland and for northern parts of Northern Ireland with some outbreaks of rain arriving, 13 or 14 Celsius here, but we keep the sunny spells further south, 15 to 16 degrees, a degree or so cooler compared with Monday, but with light winds and those sunny skies, I think, feeling pleasant enough. Into the evening and uh, the outbreaks of rain start to turn heavier and more persistent for Northern Ireland, Western Scotland. And that rain spreads across the country during Wednesday, a wet and windy day for many on Thursday, showers on Friday. Weekday afternoons on GB News, we've got the whole of the UK covered. From 12 to 3, it's GB News Day with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Gloria De Piero. You'll get the very latest on everything that's been going on across our great nation. And from 3 till 6, watch out for GB News Live with me, Patrick Christie. I'm not here to mess around with all the biggest topics and guests. You will always be up to date. GB News Day and GB News Live from 12 p.m. Only on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB Plus Digital Radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm, where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee, but we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11pm. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11pm, seven nights a week. Hello and a very warm welcome to GB Newsday with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Gloria de Piero, with you until three. Our headlines this afternoon, a wave of missile attacks on Ukraine's major cities have killed at least 10 people and injured many more. Britain's Security Minister Tom Tugendhat has accused the Russians of carrying out war crimes. Meanwhile, President Putin has been addressing his war cabinet in St. Petersburg, threatening further retaliation for what he called was terrorism. Also on the programme, another government U-turn. Has the Chancellor been spooked by the markets or his own MPs? Quasi Kwarteng now moving the date to reveal his tax and spending plans to Halloween. And just stop, all protesters blocked the mall outside Buckingham Palace this morning. The latest in a series of demonstrations that have disrupted traffic.
Pavel in the capital. And of course, we want to hear what you'll think about all the stories making our headlines today. Email us with your thoughts because opinion important. GB News at GBviews.uk. Before that, though, latest news headlines with Rosie. Very good afternoon to you. Coming up to two minutes past one, I'm Rosie Wright, keeping you up to date today on GB News. G7 leaders will hold urgent talks tomorrow to discuss their response to the Russian airstrikes in Ukraine. Authorities say at least 10 people have been killed and at least 60 are injured as explosions hit several cities, including the capital. The UK is keeping a close eye on what's being described as the increasingly reckless tactics by Russia, with the Foreign Secretary saying firing missiles in civilian areas is unacceptable. Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky says 11 important infrastructure facilities in Kyiv and eight regions have been damaged. They want panic and chaos. They want to destroy our energy system. They are hopeless. The second target is people, such as time, such goals were specifically chosen to cause as much damage as possible. But we are Ukrainians. We help each other. We believe in ourselves. We restore everything that is destroyed. Russia's President Vladimir Putin says it was right to retaliate after the Crimea blast at the weekend. He accused Ukraine of a targeted attack, with a major bridge being damaged when a truck exploded. Putin warned if attacks continue against Russia, he will respond. <laughs> If attempts to carry out acts of terrorism on our territory continue, Russia's response will be harsh and its scale will correspond to that of the threat made against the Russian Federation. No one should be in any doubt about that. Russia's actions. The EU has condemned Russia's actions. A spokesperson for the EU's foreign policy chief described the attacks as barbaric. The Russia is... Um opting for a tactics uh, with aiming and indiscriminately bombing the civilians. This is something which is inter against international humanitarian law and this indiscriminate targeting of civilians amounts to a war crime. In other news now, the Chancellor's about to pressure to bring forward his much-anticipated medium-term fiscal plan. Last week, in an exclusive interview with GB News, the Chancellor said he was going to stick to the original date in mid-November. Today, though, in a letter to the Chairman of the Commons Treasury Committee, Kwasi Kwarteng said it will now be published on October the 31st. The Liberal Democrats have accused the government of making a screeching U-turn, warning of a Halloween horror show, unless there's a clear plan for the economy. Scotland's first minister is expected to tell SNP delegates that independence for the country will lead to a better relationship between the UK's four nations. Nicola Sturgeon, who's due to close the party conference in Aberdeen, will also accuse the UK government of denying Scottish democracy. We'll bring you her speech live on GB News this afternoon. The Supreme Court are going to rule this week if a prospective bill to hold another vote of independence is within the powers of Holyrood. The Prime Minister is going to urge MPs to work together as a united party as Parliament resumes this week. Liz Truss has now appointed Greg Hands as International Trade Minister. It's a move seen as an attempt to ease Tory tensions. Hands, who supported Rishi Sunak during the leadership contest, replaces Connor Burns, who was sacked from his role on Friday following a misconduct complaint. Well, the Work and Pensions Minister, Victoria Prentice, told GB News that the government right now is working for stability. What's important to us, really, is that we provide that careful, sensible, calm government which the public need and deserve. I don't think people are interested in the interior workings of the Conservative Party. A former nurse has pleaded not guilty to the murders of multiple babies. Appearing at Manchester Crown Court, Lucy Letby is accused of killing seven children and attempting to kill ten more between 2015 and 16. She was working at the Countess of Chester Hospital in Chester at the time. The trial is expected to take up to six months. Criminal barristers in England and Wales have voted to end their strike action after accepting a pay offer from the government. The offer from the Ministry of Justice includes reforms to set fees for legal aid work and an investment of £54 million in the criminal bar. Almost 57% voted to accept the deal. Strike action will end at six tonight. The chairman of the Criminal Bar Association, Kirsty Brimlow, told GB News there's still a lot of anger amongst members.
The offer really did hit the demands of the criminal bar. However, a number of barristers still consider that it hasn't gone far, far enough. There's still a lot of trust in government that has to be realised and we hope that this is the start of a constructive arrangement. The number of people crossing the Channel in a single day has topped 1,000 for the fourth time in under two months. Ministry of Defence figures show 1,065 people made the journey from France to the UK yesterday in 25 small boats. The latest crossings bring the total number to over 34,700 individuals so far this year. You're up to date now on GB News. I'll bring you more as it develops. Now, back to Newsday. Explosions have hit major Ukrainian cities, including the capital, Kyiv, killing at least 10 people and injuring 60. Well, Russia, it's estimated, has so far fired 83 missiles at various targets uh, across uh, Ukraine. Uh, reported now that one of those has hit the German consulate building uh, in uh, Ukraine, but not being used at the time. It had been evacuated and uh, several missiles also shot down, say, the Ukrainian Air Force. President Zelensky said Russia was trying to wipe his country off the face of the earth. While here, Security Minister Tom Tugendhat described the attacks as a war crime. Well, they came after the only bridge connecting Russia to Crimea partially exploded on Saturday morning. These were the uh, incredible pictures of that uh, event. However, Ukraine so far not admitting any responsibility for that particular explosion. President Putin spoke earlier this morning confirming the strikes that hit Ukraine this morning and has promised a harsh response to any other attacks on Russian territory. Well, elsewhere, the leader of Belarus, Alexander Lukashenko, now stating that both Belarus and Russia are to form a joint military group. Let's but... take a look at some of yeah. where the explosions have hit Ukraine now. As you can see, some of the cities that have been hit include Ternopol and Lviv in the west of Ukraine and Dnipro, which is in the south of Ukraine, also been missile strikes in the capital, Kyiv. Well, as we're hearing, the Ukrainian Air Force saying it has managed to hit some of the missiles coming in. But let's now speak to the former president of Ukraine, Petro Poroshenko, who joins us. Thank you very much indeed for taking uh, the time to talk to us in uh, is what another difficult day for uh, your country. Um, Putin in St. Petersburg saying that they have targeted military and uh, communications and uh, energy infrastructure. But it does appear from the pictures we're getting many civilian areas have been hit. I'm standing here now where a couple of hours it was a Russian missile attack. And as you see, this is the children's playground. Exactly here, the Russian uh, missiles attack at 8 in the morning was in the real center of Kiev. This is just 100 meters from the Kiev University where I graduated the international relations. I think we and may have just had an interruption on the signal. No, uh, so, sorry, uh, Mr. Poroshenko, we, we just had a, a break-up on the signal. You were just saying that this is near the, the university where you studied and, and clearly very close to that children's playground. Yeah, I'm exactly here on the children's playing grass. And uh, the Russian missile attack is attacked the 11 uh, region of Ukraine, not 8, as you mentioned on your map. And this. I, well, I think we are struggling with the line, but we, but we can now speak to Philip Ingram, who is a former senior military intelligence officer and NATO planner. Uh, Philip, thank you for joining us. Putin has, has pledged a harsh response. We're already seeing some evidence of that. But previous warnings from the deputy head of Russia's Security Council that any attack on the Crimea bridge would trigger Judgment Day. What could they have meant by that? Well, the Crimean bridge is vital to, 
two things. One, the resupply of uh, the Russian troops, especially in the southern part of Ukraine through Crimea uh, and Russian capability inside Crimea. Um, and the second thing is um, it, it's such a big uh, project that is in Vladimir Putin's own personal um, uh, area of emphasis because he's the one that set it up. He's the one that opened it. Um, and the, the attack uh, that destroying the bridge was on the day after Putin's 70th birthday. So from a credibility perspective, uh, from an information perspective, it's a huge blow to Putin personally, but it's also a massive blow to the logistics supply to Russian troops who are still in illegally in Ukraine. And what about the response uh, where clearly Ukraine is now counting the cost of, uh, well, many civilian areas having been hit? We were just speaking there to Mr Poroshenko at that uh, kid's playground. Um, the indications are that the Russians still have this capability of long-range missiles. The Russians uh, do have a massive capability of long-range missiles, but uh, I think what we're seeing here today is is two factors. One, um, they don't care whether they hit civilian uh, areas, uh, and actually they actively target civilian areas to try and create terror amongst the civilian population, to try and uh, therefore undermine uh, the, the political support um, that, that there is in the country, um, and uh, to undermine international political support, but also the inaccuracy of the missiles. Many of the missiles that are being used are, are highly inaccurate. They're, they're not precision weapons weapons as uh, we, we uh, in the West have provided the Ukrainians. Um, and you, you get this sort of effect. Um, and what the Russians are doing is committing war crimes. Uh, you're the UK security minister, I think, has just called Russia out for that. And I think he's completely accurate. What does the international community do about that? The international community, many figures, including our own Tom Tugendhat, saying what you have just said, that these are war crimes. What do we do? Well, what we have to do is redouble our resolve um, to support Russia. You know, Russia is this. This isn't going to stop here. You know, Russia is holding its Security Council meeting today, chaired by Vladimir Putin. Um, they will uh, carry out um, more attacks inside Ukraine across Ukrainian cities. They will increase their information operations and potentially carry out other activities to try and fracture international community support. If ever there's a time that the international community needs to redouble its resolve, come together, increase the supply of weapon systems into Ukraine in modern weapon systems to target um, uh, Russian military uh, and to continue to target um, uh, areas that are of vital military utility to the Russians, including the, uh, the Crimean Bridge, again, if the Russians manage to repair it and get it open. And what about that uh, equipment in detail? Uh, clearly, we've, we've had some very advanced uh, battlefield artillery that we've supplied, and it seems to be very effective. But, but what about defensive capability with these, these uh, missiles coming in? Is there something that we could give the Ukrainians to make their skies safer from these missiles? Yeah, the Ukrainians you know, successfully intercepted um, uh, by their own statistics 41 of the 83 missiles that are coming in. Um, we can give them uh, more... Uh, air defence capability. The difficulty is we're not going to be able to ever give them enough air defence capability to cover all of the cities across Ukraine. So there will still be areas that are that remain vulnerable and the Russians will still be able to identify those. So you're know, giving more and more air defence capability will reduce the number of missiles that, that are successfully um, hitting Ukrainian cities, but it's not going to take it away completely. We need to balance that with giving the, the Ukrainians the capability to uh, redouble their offensive operations to push Russia back even further uh, and get Putin to the, the breaking point. We're already starting to see cracks inside Moscow. Um, we need those cracks to get bigger um, and for Putin's regime to break completely. Our Prime Minister and fellow leaders of G7 nations will hold crisis talks on the situation in Ukraine tomorrow. What more do they need to do other than talk? Well, the, the talking is important uh, and the messaging that comes out of it is making sure that that international community piece is solid. You know, Putin is attacking the cracks that there are in the international community in the support that there is for Ukraine and will continue to do so. The international community needs to come back and say it's solid. We need those nations that are that have promised to supply weapons potentially early in next year to bring that weapon supply forward. We need more money going into Ukraine. We need a, increased international pressure on those countries that are still supporting Russia, uh, in particular China, India, Pakistan, Iran, North Korea, um, and, and, and keep pushing them to um, get off the fence and um, find against Russia and recognise what Russia is doing is illegal under international law.
Philip Ingram, thank you very much indeed for joining us here on GB News Day. And uh, our apologies about the breakup of the signal there with Ukraine, uh, with uh, Mr. Poroshenko. But clearly, uh, communication is very difficult in the country at the moment, given uh, what's happening. Some of those missiles were being told still being fired at Ukraine. Uh, more, of course, as we get it. As we've been reporting this morning, there's been another government U time, this time on the date of the Chancellor's fiscal statement on balancing government finances. We can talk now to Tom Harwood, our political correspondent, who is just out of what's known as the lobby briefing. This is where the Prime Minister's official spokesperson, don't know if it's a man or a woman, um, tells journalists like our Tom what the message is. What have you been hearing, Tom? Well, Gloria, I can confirm it is a man, although sometimes, uh, sometimes when uh, the official spokesman is on holiday, it does swap around. But yes, no, it's a bloke. Um, but today uh, we have been exploring so many issues. I cannot begin to reel off the length of this list. It really does illustrate just how monumental a task waits before government. Of course, it feels like Parliament has been in some sort of suspended animation for the last few months, really, of course. You'll remember that long long leadership contest over the summer, followed by a brief return only to be halted by, of course, the period of national mourning. A couple of days back, a mini budget and then conference season. And for the past few weeks, we've been darting around the country following the various parties as they gather, as they talk through what they really need to do in the coming weeks, months and indeed years. But now, now it's crunch time. Parliament returns tomorrow and it has a job on its hands. Everything from energy to the escalating crisis in Ukraine to so many other different issues. And uh, really, I think we can talk through some of those now. Firstly, the Prime Minister has on her hands a G7 call tomorrow, not only with the G7 leaders, uh, Macron, Biden, Trudeau and the rest of them, but also with President Zelensky sitting in for, for part of this call. Now, this has been revealed by Number 10 in the last hour or so. A very important call, no doubt, for Western coordination as the cries in some quarters grow in terms of how the West might respond to this escalation by Russia. Indeed, the Prime Minister's spokesman was asked in our briefing a little bit earlier whether or not Russia's escalation, Russia's strikes against some civilian targets, we understand now, uh, should mean that perhaps uh, the West would think about stepping back or going for a negotiated solution, because as the Ukrainians advance, uh, it seems that the Russians become more aggressive. Well, Number 10's response was an emphatic no, the idea that the alternative would be so much worse. Indeed, if we were to withdraw our support from Ukraine, so say Number 10, Russia would only get more aggressive, more assertive, and the issues would grow and grow. But of course, related to that, we're also talking about energy. And interestingly, there's a story that has been bubbling along for the past few days about whether or not solar farms will be banned in the United Kingdom. Now, um, the Prime Minister's spokesman was relatively evasive on this subject, saying that there will be more to come in this series of announcements we're expecting on eight different areas of supply-side reform in the coming weeks and months. But I asked whether specifically farmers were best placed to decide what goes on their own land or the government. Who should decide, who should ban, who should step in? And interestingly, the, the, interestingly, the Prime Minister's spokesman said that the Prime Minister thought that farmers were best placed on that particular issue, which may well mean that we might get some solar farms after all. Clearly a bit of a battle there between the, uh, the Environment Department and indeed the Energy Department. But uh, of course, as with so many of these issues, so much more is to come over the coming days. Tom Harwood, Harwood uh, rather the farmer's friend in Downing Street. Thanks very much indeed uh, on uh, up uh, uh, the uh, lobby briefing and, uh, of course, what may be coming in these days ahead. The government will reveal details of its growth plan ahead of the Chancellor's medium-term fiscal plan on October the 31st. This follows Kwasi Kwarteng's U-turn this morning on when that date would be and what would accompany the statement while well, joining us in the studio now is our business and economics editor, Liam Halligan, who had that exclusive interview with Kwasi Kwarteng last week. You are going to bring forward the fiscal assessment 
uh, in conjunction with the Office of Budget Responsibility. Said you that. said in your speech yesterday that will happen shortly. Is shortly before the 23rd? So shortly is the 23rd. I mean, uh, people reading the runes and parsing. So it is going to be the 23rd of the, November. The, the, you're, the, you're not bringing that fiscal it's, it's, plan it's going to be. It, it's going to be the 23rd of November. Okay. Liam is with us in the studio. We were reading the runes, or, or perhaps the wrong runes, I don't know. Or just listening to what the Chancellor actually said on camera in plain English. <laughs> well, there's a change, yeah. No need to overanalyze it. The guy said it, and yeah. now it's changed. Twice. Twice. And now it's changed. And I think this points to... You know, it's been a very rocky start uh, for the Chancellor and the Prime Minister. I think a lot of people uh, in the Conservative Party, and indeed a lot of people across the country, agree in general that we need to... You know, get some rocket boosters under this economy. We need to grow more. We, the economy has been really sluggish, basically, since the global financial crisis of 2008-9. Our average growth rate, the average expansion of the economy each year, has been sort of 1, 1.5%, 1 rather than 2, 2.5%. Two and, and that changes everything. That means there's a lot less government revenue. It means there's a lot less money and wealth to go around. It feels... The country feels as if there's less buoyancy and less kind of enterprise. And yet they've changed now, as you say, uh, the date of this important fiscal statement. And it seems to be not so much in the face of market pressure, because the markets have been relatively calm over the last week or so. The Bank of England said it had 65 billion quid to support the bond market. It's used hardly any of it. Mm. It's used like three billion. Mm. So the idea the government's or the Bank of England has spent 65 billion pounds on this. Whatever you hear from broadcast journalists who don't actually understand it, that's nonsense. It's three or four billion pounds they spent so far. But this is largely, Mark, I would say, political pressure. Right. And interesting, uh, Tom was saying that they've had the lobby briefing. Uh, a line here uh, from um, the Prime Minister's official spokesperson. Uh, the government confident it can provide enough detail on policy for the Office for Budget Responsibility to publish its economic forecast mm. alongside the Chancellor Financial Strategy. Mm. And this is almost as important, isn't it, for particularly the Bank of England when it makes its interest rate decision on November the 3rd, as to how we're going to go forward. What is the long-term picture looking like? It is important. And look, there's a very respectable argument that I'm surprised the government hasn't been making more to delay this fiscal assessment as long as you can. Mm. Why? Because what really matters in terms of how government spending will change in the next month or two until the end of the fiscal year is that energy price cap, mm. the wholesale price of gas. If the wholesale price of gas spikes up, the government's going to spend, you know, possibly a couple of hundred billion pounds. Huge amounts of money when you think it only collects about 900 billion pounds in revenue each year. If the wholesale price of gas comes away, falls, then the, that energy price cap, delivering that for firms and households, may not cost any money at all. So if I'd have been the Chancellor or indeed the Prime Minister, I'd have been saying, look, it makes sense to delay trying to get your narrative out there. But they don't seem to have done that. And yes, there's lots of politics going on. The Treasury Select Committee chair, who's really leading the charge to force politically Mel the Chancellor, yeah. he is um, a Conservative MP, but he's also Rishi Sunak's former campaign manager. There is very much a sense at Westminster that Rishi Sunak, the former Chancellor who lost in that Tory leadership contest, of course, to Liz Truss, uh, is waiting in the wings if the government doesn't look particularly sure-footed. So, at least for now, this is less about pressure from financial markets and, indeed, borrowing costs that affect people's mortgages, that affect people's personal loans, have been largely steady today. They went up a little bit and now they've come back. This is mainly political theatre rather than, in my view, uh, financial market turmoil. Liam? As ever, thank you very much indeed. And, uh, of course, more reaction to the markets as we get it. And coming up, we'll be heading to the Scottish National Party conference to get the latest ahead of Nicola Sturgeon's key speech uh, this afternoon. That's after a quick break.
Weekday afternoons on GB News, we've got the whole of the UK covered. From 12 to 3, it's GB News Day with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Gloria Di Piero. You'll get the very latest on everything that's been going on across our great nation. And from 3 till 6, watch out for GB News Live with me, Patrick Christie's. I'm not here to mess around with all the biggest topics and guests. You will always be up to date. GB News Day and GB News Live from 12 p.m. Only on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB Plus Digital Radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm, where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee, but we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11pm. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11pm, seven nights a week. Welcome back to GB Newsday. We're crossing live now to the SNP Party Conference in Aberdeen to speak to our political editor, uh, head of Nicola Sturgeon's key speech in about an hour and a half's time. Darren, what is she going to say? Well, I think a few things, uh, unsurprisingly. First of all, Scottish independence, again, unsurprising. It has been essentially the main topic of conversation during this party conference over the weekend. Nicola Sturgeon essentially trying to vent her frustration to a large degree that she thinks the SNP have got a mandate from those Hollywood elections last year for another independence referendum. She's even set a date, October of next year. However, the problem is, of course, it's not really her decision to make, at least at the moment. And that is why she's going to the UK Supreme Court. It's going to start its hearings tomorrow about whether it is MSPs in Hollywood or whether it is MPs of Westminster who have the final say. Now, okay, the thought yes. process is, I'm not an illegal eagle, but the thought process is uh, yeah, that it will be ultimately the decision of Westminster to make and not the SNP here in Scotland. And that almost certainly means that a referendum is not going to happen okay, anytime no, soon because Liz Truss has repeatedly said never, never, never to it happening. So what is Nicola Sturgeon's backup plan? Well, it is effectively to use the 2024 general election as a de facto uh, referendum, though I'm not entirely sure how constitutionally that's going to work, given the fact that it is a general election and clearly not a referendum. So there will be a lot of talk about that. She will talk about how she does not want to give up the hope of an independent Scotland. But also, I think she is going to talk about this kind of cost of living crisis, uh, energy security. It is pretty clear that the SNP realise, unsurprisingly, that it is a big issue. They need to address it. There clearly is a bit of flexibility within what Hollywood can do to try and change a little things or change a bit of a direction from what Westminster can achieve. And then on energy security, there'll be lots of talk about renewable energy. The SNP opposed to nuclear energy expansion north of the border, but what they are in favour of these enormous wind farms. I think Scotland is the windiest place in Europe, and there is real potential, actually, for sustainable energy security with those wind farms. So it will be a pretty wide-ranging speech, as you say, it's due to take a little place a little bit later on this afternoon. And I assume there will be a lot of attack lines, unsurprisingly, on the Conservative Party. Uh, she's been pretty spicy over the weekend with some of the remarks she's made, some thinking she went a little too far. And also attacks on Labour as well, interestingly, Gloria. And the reason I say interesting on that is because Labour have started to tick up in the polls quite substantially in recent weeks. Yes, they're ticking quite a few votes from the Conservative Party, or at least opinion poll leads from the Conservative Party. But I think there is a slight fear of a resurgence Labour inside the SNP. We're going to hear from Nicola Sturgeon at 3.15 this afternoon. 
And, and quickly then, Darren, key question as to how Scotland will pay for itself as an independent uh, country. John Swinney's report on that not being released until after this conference. Have they explained why? Uh, not really. I think in many ways, though, what they're trying to do is kind of take this step by step, if you like. I mean, first of all, they just need to get over this hurdle of the Supreme Court. And that decision is, not, is going to take a couple of months, at least. And also, to be fair to John Swinney, I think an awful lot of his attention is actually on the upcoming Scottish Parliament budget, which is going to be at the start of December. And there are lots of questions there about what the SNP might do, not least of all on taxation. There are big questions, and Nicola Sturgeon really wouldn't be drawn on this yesterday, about whether they will go ahead with that... England, Wales and Northern Ireland tax cuts uh, for lower income earners when they drop the, top, the bottom rate of tax sorry, from 20 pence to 19. The SNP not clear on that. So some big, big fiscal questions actually uh, for uh, the SNP to answer. And yes, those big, big questions, of course, constitutional questions about what the economy will look like, what currency they will use, will they start at the Bank of England? You know, those questions ahead of any second referendum will be unsurprisingly at the forefront of everyone's minds. Darren, thank you. We'll speak to you later in the show. After the break, Just Stop Oil activists have been active again with protests taking place in central London this morning. We'll be covering that. First, it's your news update. Good afternoon. It's 1.32. I'm Rosie Wright, keeping you up to date on GB News. G7 leaders will hold urgent talks tomorrow to discuss their response to the Russian airstrikes in Ukraine. Authorities say at least 10 people have been killed and at least 60 injured as explosions hit several cities, including the capital. The UK is keeping a close eye on what's being described as the increasingly reckless tactics by Russia, with the Foreign Secretary saying firing missiles in civilian areas is unacceptable. Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky says 11 important infrastructure facilities in Kyiv and eight regions have been damaged. Russia's President Vladimir Putin said it was right to retaliate after, after the Crimea blast. He accused Ukraine of a targeted attack at the weekend when a truck exploded, damaging a bridge. Putin warned if the attacks continue against Russia, the response will be harsh. To other news now, and the Chancellor has bowed to pressure to bring forward his much-anticipated medium-term fiscal plan. Last week, in an exclusive interview with GB News, Kwasi Kwarteng said he was going to stick to the original date in mid-November. Today, in a letter to the Chairman of the Commons Treasury Committee, he says it will now be published on October the 31st. Scotland's First Minister is expected to tell SNP delegates that independence will lead to a better relationship between the UK's four nations. Nicola Sturgeon is due to close the party conference shortly in Aberdeen, is also going to accuse the UK government of denying Scottish democracy. But we'll bring you her speech live here on GB News just after three o'clock this afternoon. The King has sent a message of condolence to the President of Ireland following the death of 10 people in Friday's petrol station explosion in County Donegal. He said both he and the Queen Consort have been filled with immense sadness. They offered their heartfelt sympathy to those affected in what he described as a devastating tragedy. We're on your TV, online and DAB Plus Radio. This is GB News. Here's a quick snapshot of today's markets. The pound will buy you... Just give me one second. Weekday afternoons on GB News, we've got the whole of the UK covered. From 12 to 3, it's GB News Day with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Gloria Di Piero. You'll get the very latest on everything that's been going on across our great nation. And from 3 till 6, watch out for GB News Live with me, Patrick Christie's. I'm not here to mess around with all the biggest topics and guests. You will always be up to date. GB News Day and GB News Live from 12 p.m. Only on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB Plus Digital Radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. 
on your smart speaker, phone or tablet or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm, where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee. But we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11pm. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11pm, seven nights a week. This is GB Newsday. The time is 1.36. Environmental protesters blocked the mall outside Buckingham Palace this morning. Around 25 Just Stop Oil activists sat in the road and some of them glued their hands together in protest against new fossil fuel licences. Well, police did manage to clear the road in time for the changing of the guard, which is just as well. Could have been a bit messy. Uh, some of the protesters also arrested and uh, are now uh, being questioned. It all comes after Animal Rebellion held protests in central London at the weekend when they were calling for a plant-based future. Earlier, we spoke to Nathan McGovern, who is a spokesperson for Animal Rebellion. Here's, uh, have a listen to what he said to us. Rebellion is just a group of really, really concerned people from all across the country who see what the science, you know, what Oxford and Harvard universities are telling us about solutions to the climate crisis and are pushing for the government to implement them. It's as simple as that. So but what about you, the tactics? Yeah. It's the tactics it's, it's that, that people... It's action, isn't that it? Yeah. Probably lots of people have sympathy with your arguments. It's the tactics you employ. No, yeah, I really do understand that. And, you know, what I would say to that is, you know, we've, we've sent letters, we've signed petitions, you know, we've talked to our MPs, we've done all, you know, those proper ways, you know, you're meant to communicate. And yet nothing changes. I absolutely do support the actions of Extinction Rebellion and Just Stop Oil. I see that they are pushing for a better world, a better future for everyone, just as Animal Rebellion is. You sound like a kind-hearted chap. So if you were blocking the road, you see an ambulance coming, or a mum with, with a child who needs to get to a doctor in a car, you'd move, right? Um, so what I'd say is, you know, if you saw from Just Stop Oil, I believe it's two to three days ago, they actually let an ambulance through. You know, you, you must have seen that yourself. So there is a blue light policy absolutely for emergency vehicles. You know, I would like to, you know, take this opportunity to personally apologise for the inconvenience and disruption to ordinary people's lives. You know, it isn't something that is taken lightly as a decision. And as I say, you know, we've tried all the so-called proper means of, of communication. Oh, but we can see from some of these pictures there is growing frustration among... Well, that was Nathan McGovern with speaking with to us a little earlier, spokesperson for Animal Rebellion, as uh, you were hearing, apologising but saying protests would continue. Well, joining us now is motoring journalist Danny Kelly. Danny, we understand you're not a fan of these protests, but um, as we were hearing from our earlier guests, it's a democracy. They feel like the traditional means of lobbying your MP, signing a petition, they don't work, so they feel that this is their only course of action to get heard. No, I agree. Uh, I'm all behind peaceful protest, Gloria and Mark, but we mustn't forget that they're actually breaking their law. If they impede people on the King's Highway, as it is now, then they're breaking the law. When I saw the VT of that lad jumping out of the van and unceremoniously dragging this guy off the tarmac, and when the guy, in his eyes, had the temerity to try and come back and block his van, he was unceremoniously shoved in the chest. And, and I've got to say, I, I don't put a smile on my face. Well, you mustn't forget that they're breaking the law. In, in the same way that I would like to think I would, I would have the cojones to go and tackle someone who's just about to break into your car outside the studio, Gloria, I, I, I'd like to think that I'd have the, the cojones to do what that lad did. They're breaking the law. The, the blue light policy is 
uh, of course they must move for blue lights, but they mustn't forget that people have emergencies who aren't being conveyed in police cars, ambulances, or indeed when someone comes to try and put out a house fire. You know, people need to, to get to work. They're, they're disrupting the working man and the working woman's day, and it's costing them money. Potentially it's costing lives down the line because there's lots of consequences, lots of knock-on offences, uh, effects. And, and there's a great video about the French cops uh, in, in France uh, literally just tearing these, these super-glued hands off the auto route. And I'd like to see something similar to that happen in the UK. I'm watching the video right now. Uh, and yeah, that put a smile on my face. That guy being being shoved in the chest. Why not? Good. It's about time. Liz, he could actually be accused of uh, ABH himself, of course, in terms of assaulting someone. It's a very difficult thing for the police to judge. We're being told that the protest this morning in the Mall was moved by the police. They actually uh, unstuck some of those hands in time for changing of the guard, which is just as well, because clearly uh, if you're facing lifeguards on the horseback, it might be a different matter for them. Yeah, imagine that being kicked in the face by a, a royal horse. That would teach him a, a lesson. I've got no sympathy for them. I have every sympathy for their cause. You know, I, I understand about the climate emergency. I get that. But I think that if they want the public to be on their side, they should at least maybe have a moratorium on these protests until that lunatic in Russia is stopped doing what he's doing and, and all of the, the crazy oil prices, which are a consequence of that unhinged idiot. I think that they should say, look, we're going to give it six or nine months. We, we want to keep you on side. And at the moment, in my view, they're, they're, they're not reading the room. I think, if anything, they are losing more and more uh, support from people who, like me, want to see the end of a, a climate emergency. So, Danny, aren't protests and demos necessarily disruptive? What is the line? What is the acceptable line, in your view, uh, for protests? Criminal behaviour. So, but so, so it's not just disruption. So you can march through the streets. You can bring people. Uh, you can stop people going about their daily business. You can, if you've got, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands, sometimes tens of thousands, of people marching through a city or area. That is legitimate. <laughs> That, well, that's done with the advance uh, uh, support of, like, for example, in my case, West Midlands Police. If I wanted to organise a, a, a thousand-man march against something, I'd have to go through West Midlands plot and say, look, this is what I want to do. Which roads are you OK with me marching down? We see it all the time. You know, West Midlands Police will work with Just Stop Oil. If they want to if they want to <laughs> carry out a protest in a, in, a, in a legal way, then all they've got to do is call Lloyd House in Birmingham and say, look, we want to march down... Birmingham City Centre on a Saturday morning between 9 and 10.30. It happens all the time. But this is without the support of the police. This is, this is just spontaneous criminal behaviour. Do you think the police are actually handling it in the right way at the moment? They seem to have got uh, a grip on um, actually taking the superglue off the, uh, uh, the road surfaces. They've got this uh, stuff that they can squirt all over their hands. And, of course, they are giving these people the chance to actually make the protest before then moving them on. Well, that's a balance for the police to make, isn't it? Because don't forget, guys, there is the potential of a public order risk. I mean, we saw it today with that guy. If you want to say the guy was assaulted, then that is a direct consequence of some criminal behaviour. So you potentially have criminal behaviour um, happening because of criminal behaviour. So if the police think that there's a balance to be struck, give them half an hour, then unglue their hands, then maybe that's, that's a, a positive way of doing it. But how long that will be supported by the public. You know, if someone... Like that lad who jumped out of his van, he, I, I got the impression he was a builder or a, a plumber or something, potentially on the way to a job in order to put food on the table for his family. Uh, so it's a difficult balance. And I know that 55 of the Just Stop Oil protesters have been, I think, pr imprisoned in the last couple of weeks. So so I even though I, I hate what they do, I don't hate them individually. I've never met them. They're probably charming, nice people. I hate that, that they do this... And you have to admire the tenacity and the determination of them, just to, just to give them that credit. Some of them are in prison right now because of it. Yeah, and the fact we're talking about them as well. Uh, Danny, as ever, thank you very much indeed for joining us for the thank overviews. You. Thanks for joining us in the West Midlands there, thanks. Now, Labour appears to be enjoying a happier period of late as the party enjoys a huge lead in the polls over the government for, well, for a long, long time. Uh, just today, we've seen another U-turn from the Chancellor who has bowed pressure to bring forward his medium-term 
fiscal plan, that's a sort of budget to me and you, and publish it alongside independent economic forecasts on October the 31st. So, what can Labour do to keep up the momentum? What can the Conservatives do to claw back that lead? Uh, leader of the Labour Party, Sir Keir Starmer, answering questions to the media on benefits, uh, cross-party uh, issues, and why the Labour Party are in a position to govern now, in his view. On benefits, the government insists they can't decide how to uprate benefits until they've got the latest official data on earnings, on inflation, and an announcement will be made at the end of November. Is that not sensible? Well, uh, there's nothing sensible in a kamikaze budget of two and a half weeks ago, which has caused a loss of confidence in the markets in our economy. Uh, that is having a direct consequence on people. And we're only having this debate about benefits because of the damage that this government's inflicted on our economy. So I don't think it's for the government to tell anybody else uh, what's sensible because they've been totally irresponsible. They know, we know, that benefits should be increased in line with inflation. 40% of those on benefits are in work. 30% can't work because of disability. And I can't think that any political party can possibly think it's right to uh, ensure, you know, to put the most vulnerable in a position uh, where they find it even harder to make ends meet. Why are you talking to unhappy Conservative MPs who want to work with you, potentially, to block any attempt not to increase benefits in line with inflation? Look, where MPs of any political party, including the Tory party, want to work with us to do the right thing, um, then of course we'll work with them. Um, I think it's very telling that um, you know, in the aftermath of this kamikaze budget, uh, we've got a government that's still not taking responsibility for what it has done to our economy in the last two and a half weeks. And instead of actually taking responsibility and reversing it, they're fighting like cats in a sack. And I think for the public looking on, who are directly affected by the irresponsibility of this government, they'll be aghast. So anybody who wants to work with us to help stabilise the economy um, is very, very welcome. And those conversations happening now with some Conservatives? There are always conversations going on across Parliament. How worried are you that your recent Labour's recent poll leads are more to do with problems and turmoil in the Conservative Party rather than you really breaking through with the public? What matters at a time like this, when the government see, when the public see a government in complete chaos, um, having a direct impact on their own finances, is the public, I think, then look at what's the alternative. And I think what this reflects is not only the chaos of the government, but also when they look to Labour, they see a changed party, and they see a party ready to govern and putting forward the solutions for the future. So when it comes to freezing energy bills, we were the first party to say that that should happen. Windfall tax on oil and gas companies out there leading the argument. So it's very important, I think, to reflect not only the chaos of the government in this, but the Labour Party has changed. We're in a position to govern, and we are answering the questions that are on the minds of so many millions of people across the country. Hamilton, who's a former advisor to several senior uh, figures in the at uh, Labour Party, Tom Watson, Ed Miliband, and is firmly in the new Labour tradition, I would say. Tom, uh, good to see you. This isn't how I intended to start um, my, my interview with you, but just looking at that clip, don't you think the Labour Party needs a broadcast officer? Because he looks like he's trapped in a storeroom. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how they make their decisions about where they uh, where they where they put him. Um, yeah, there's quite a lot going on in that shot, but um, <laughs> uh, I'm not going to I'm not going to criticise anyone's background, given that I'm sat in my kitchen finding just about the only spot that hasn't got um, a, a mess behind me. <laughs> Very good. The the point that um, and that was an, a pool clip, what was known as a pool clip, where um, an interview is given to several broadcasters. Uh, to use, and, and the point that was made by the journalist doing it for us all was that Labour's fortunes are really down to the Tories' woes, to the government's woes. How fair is that? Well, I think that's probably pretty much always fair of any opposition that uh, that has a lead. Um, you know, there's always this is pretty basic stuff, but you need there's two things that an opposition party needs to win. One is uh, they need a lot of people to think that the government isn't fit to govern anymore, and the second thing is they think need to think that the opposition is is ready to come in. And I think um, you know, Keir Starmer has done a lot of work with the Labour Party to get into a situation where people think of it as. You know, a viable party that they can imagine being a government. They can imagine Keir Starmer being a prime minister um, and not, you know, not being a, a, an embarrassment. Um, 
they clearly need to do a bit more to explain what they do. I think the, the building blocks are there, but a lot more detail is going to be needed. But to be fair to Labour, there's a couple of years to go. But absolutely, I don't think anyone would deny, I'm sure people at the top of the Labour Party wouldn't deny that the recent performance of the Tory party, um, you know, what Liz Truss and Quasi Quarting have done in the last two or three weeks has, has got has, has a lot to do with what's happened. You haven't seen Labour go from a 10-point lead to a 30-point lead in the polls in, you know, in, in the space of a week just because of things the Labour Party's done. It's uh, a lot of that has to do with the Tories. And a lot of the focus at the moment is on Tories borrowing plans, unfunded uh, borrowing. But I, I'm not sure that the Labour Party could get through an election campaign. It might be able to get through a five-minute interview here and there, but an election campaign day after day after day, shadow ministers wanting to be ministers, questions on their, questions on their economic plans. I don't think they're there yet. Um, in 1997, they had to go so far to neutralise any worries about them on the economy, they had to say, we're going to stick to Tory spending limits. Is that something that might be necessary again, in your view? Well, the problem with that is in, in 1987, to be fair to everyone involved, the Tories had quite strict spending limits. We knew what they were. One of the big problems we've got with the Tories at the moment is that they've, uh, they just haven't set out what their spending plans are. They haven't set out what their fiscal rule is. We don't know what the uh, what, what, what Tory spending plans are. So it's literally impossible for, the, for Labour to, to commit to sticking to it. That clearly causes it a different set of problems because it means that it doesn't quite know what the baseline is that it's going to be promising from. But I think what Rachel Reeves has set out in terms of um, making clear that they're not going to do any current spending that hasn't been specifically paid for um, is, is the right approach. They're going to have to spend, spell out in a lot more detail what tax rises, tax cuts, spending rises, spending cuts they're going to set out. They've set out a sort of direction of travel but they haven't set out um, the, the specifics of it, and they and they won't, I wouldn't have thought, for a while. But, I mean, the, they are, I think it's, it's unusually, they're actually further along that path than the Tories are right now. They will have okay. to see what happens at the end of the month. Tom Hamilton, always good to have you on the channel, on, on the show. We'll speak to you again soon, no doubt. But Tom Hamilton, former Labour advisor, thanks very much. Let's get more reaction now with uh, Catherine, our political reporter, joining us in the studio because we're told Liz Truss is now on a charm offensive to try and claw back these leads. What does that actually mean? What does she do? Well, I think she's going to be talking and listening, lots of listening. So Parliament, uh, House of Commons, back from tomorrow. Right. She's going to be holding policy meetings for groups of up to 30 Conservative MPs at a time over the coming weeks. She's going to be going to the tea room much more going to be talking to the 1922 backbench committee, backbench MPs, okay. on Wednesday. Kwasi Kwarteng also is going to be, has said he's going to meet with all Conservative MPs before his medium-term fiscal plan is published at the end of October. So, clearly, they are... They've been made aware yeah. by events of the last week that they cannot just go gung-ho, right. doing whatever they like without consequences. If they cannot bring the party with them or sufficient numbers right. with them, they simply won't get these policies so, through. So sticky buns to get themselves out of a sticky situation in the tea rooms. But this is the, the problem in that basically the majority of MPs did not vote for her while the majority of the party members did. And is this the, the sort of um, the, the fault line that's running through all this? I think it is, that the majority, I think only a third of them voted for her in the last uh, leadership election mm. before it went to the members. I think only 50 of them voted for her originally. So most of them do not want her in the job in the first place. But also there's an acceptance among many that she is the prime minister that they've got and they've just, just got, got to get on with it. rid mm. of one. So it will be interesting to see. Obviously, there was a total breakdown in discipline last week. Now, Penny Mordaunt, uh, leader of the House of Commons, Soella Braverman, Home Secretary, writing in the Sunday papers saying we need to unify, we need to come back together, having very publicly disagreed with yeah, yeah. policies that Liz Truss was trying to bring forward. And those Sunday papers were also saying that there may have been 20 letters that have gone into Sir Graham Brady already. I mean, is that realistic? <sighs> No, no one, the only person who knows this is how Graham many Brady. letters Graham Brady has <laughs> is Graham Brady. But some very worrying things. I mean, for instance, lovely detail in yesterday's Sunday Times, Grant Shapps has got a new £1,400 phone. Um, what? A foldable phone so he can read a spreadsheet on it. He's got a spreadsheet detailing dozens of conversations where all MPs are at. So, so this is the, the plotter's phone? 
1,400 yes. quid's worth. So that should, uh, that should worry them. And also some quite unpleasant sort of counter-briefing against Michael Gove. Somebody said to be close to the Prime Minister said there's something deeply troubling about the darkness inside Gove. It grips him and takes him over. Now, uh, the wow. Prime Minister's spokesman was asked in the lobby briefing if Michael Gove was a sadist, and uh, apparently the answer was no. Right, as we'll head to Halloween, of course, for <laughs> this state from Quasi Quarteng. Uh, I, I mean, very quickly, has there been quite a, a sort of surprise reaction at this news that they've now brought it forward to October the 31st? I don't really think it's surprising because I think from the moment it was announced yeah. that it was going to be 20, the 23rd of November, lots of people, Mel Strides specifically, but lots of others, mm were saying this is too long to wait. And only a week ago we were hearing it would be brought forward and then, of course, Kwasi Kwarteng said to Liam Halligan on this channel... We no, remember it well. absolutely not. Yeah, yeah. So lots of things changing. One more thing is that they've announced the Permanent Secretary to the Treasury is now um, James Bowler, who's Treasury official of 20 years standing. Kwasi Kwarteng had wanted to bring in Antonio Romeo. Apparently that appointment had been made but not announced and Liz Truss has insisted on... Um, Oh, tension between yeah. number 10 and number 11. Yeah. Um, Thank you very much indeed. As ever, Thank Catherine. You. Uh, we are going to be covering the latest from the Scottish National Party Conference, bringing you the news from all across the UK and beyond. Uh, first, it's your weather. Hello again, I'm Aidan McGiven from the Met Office. It's a fine day for most of us, sunny skies for many, especially for England and Wales, but it will be windy for Scotland in particular, with quite frequent showers yeah, that's where an area of low pressure resides, just to the north of Scotland. Tight isobars there bringing some strong winds, especially into the far north. But a cold front that has brought some rain earlier in the day, well, that's now clearing and the last of the cloud clears away from Kent as we head into the afternoon as well. So brighter skies there for much of England and Wales. The odd shower for northwest England, perhaps north Wales as well. But the lion's share of showers will be across northern and western Scotland, a few for the north of Northern Ireland as well. Cloudier skies here and that brisk breeze making it feel cool. Cool. 11 to 13 Celsius for Scotland and Northern Ireland, but 14 to 17 for England and Wales, where we see those bright blue skies. Heading into the evening and with light winds and clear skies for much of England, Wales, southern and eastern Scotland, well, we'll see temperatures fall away. The odd mist patch form, but... Uh, for most, it's a clear night. Cloudier conditions for the north and west of Scotland, as well as Northern Ireland, and showers continuing here, although fewer compared with the daytime. So seven or eight Celsius in the northwest, whilst low single figures are possible across sheltered parts of England and Wales, even a touch of air frost in one or two spots. So a cold start to the day for England, Wales, uh, perhaps parts of eastern Scotland, but bright skies. Into the afternoon, I think the cloud will build for Scotland and for northern parts of Northern Ireland with some outbreaks of rain arriving, 13 or 14 Celsius here. But we'll keep these sunny spells further south, 15 to 16 degrees, a degree or so cooler compared with Monday, but with light winds and those sunny skies, I think, feeling pleasant enough. Into the evening and the outbreaks of rain start to turn heavier and more persistent for Northern Ireland, western Scotland. And that rain spreads across the country during Wednesday, a wet and windy day for many on Thursday, showers on Friday. Weekday afternoons on GB News, we've got the whole of the UK covered. From 12 to 3, it's GB News Day with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Gloria Di Piero. You'll get the very latest on everything that's been going on across our great nation. And from 3 till 6, watch out for GB News Live with me, Patrick Christie's. I'm not here to mess around with all the biggest topics and guests. You will always be up to date. GB News Day and GB News Live from 12 p.m. Only on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB Plus Digital Radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Hey.
Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farrow. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11 p.m., where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee, but we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11 p.m. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Hello and welcome back to GB Newsday with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Gloria DiPiero, with you till three. Our headlines this afternoon. Wave of missile attacks on Ukraine's major cities have killed 10 people and injured 60. Britain's Security Minister Tom Tubinhart has accused the Russians of carrying out war crimes. The Foreign Secretary saying the actions are unacceptable. We'll cross to the Ukraine for the very latest as President Putin met his war cabinet in St. Petersburg earlier this morning. Also coming up on the programme, another government U-turn. The Chancellor now will bring forward the tax and spending plans to Halloween. Having told GB News exclusively last week, it wouldn't be until November. He'll also be revealing the independent assessment of those figures. Has he been spooked by the markets or his own MPs? We'll have the latest from Westminster. And Just Stop All protesters blocked the mall outside Buckingham Palace this morning. It's the latest in a series of demonstrations that have disrupted travel in the capital. And we want to hear what uh, you think about all those stories making our headlines today. Email us with your thoughts because your opinion, of course, is important to us. That's gbnews at gbviews.uk. Before that, though, latest news headlines with Rosie. Good afternoon. Two minutes past two. I'm Rosie Wright, keeping you up to date on GB News. G7 leaders are going to hold urgent talks tomorrow to discuss their response to the Russian airstrikes in Ukraine. Authorities say at least 11 people have been killed and 64 injured as explosions hit several cities, including the capital. The UK is keeping a close eye on what's being described as the increasingly reckless tactics by Russia, with the Foreign Secretary saying firing missiles in civilian areas is unacceptable. Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky says 11 important infrastructure facilities in Kyiv and eight regions have been damaged. They want panic and chaos. They want to destroy our energy system. They are hopeless. The second target is people. Such as time, such goals were specifically chosen to cause as much damage as possible. But we are Ukrainians. We help each other. We believe in ourselves. We restore everything that is destroyed. Kyiv Mayor Vitaly Klitschko is appealing for more help from the West. Millions of people living in the city of Kyiv. And this war and so-called free world must help us Ukrainians, continue to help us Ukrainians to stop this genocide of the Ukrainian population. Russia's President Vladimir Putin says it was right to retaliate after the Crimea blast at the weekend. He accused Ukraine of a targeted attack, with a major bridge being damaged when a truck exploded. Putin warned if attacks continue against Russia, he will respond. If attempts to carry out acts of terrorism on our territory continue, Russia's response will be harsh and its scale will correspond to that of the threat made against the Russian Federation. No one should be in any doubt about that. The European Union's condemned Russia's actions with a spokesperson for the EU foreign policy chief saying the airstrikes amount to a war crime. The Russia is um, opting for a tactics uh, with aiming and indiscriminately bombing the civilians. This is something which is inter against international humanitarian law and this indiscriminate targeting of civilians amounts to a war crime. In some other news now, the Chancellor has bowed to pressure to bring forward his much-anticipated medium-term fiscal plan. Last week, in an exclusive interview with GB News, Kwasi Kwarteng said he was going to stick to the original date in mid-November. 
Well, today, in a letter to the chairman of the Commons Treasury Committee, he said it will now be published on October the 31st. Labour leader Sakir Starmer has welcomed the move. I'm pleased that they've brought forward uh, this date to begin uh, the process. But what I want to see and what I would do now is reverse that kamikaze mini budget. That's got to be reversed. We need to have a windfall tax on the oil and gas companies to pay or help to pay for the energy price freeze. And what that will do, and most important of all, is to stabilise the economy because this chaotic, irresponsible approach um, is all of the government's own making. Scotland's first minister is expected to tell SNP delegates that independence for the country will lead to a better relationship between the UK's four nations. Nicola Sturgeon, who's due to close the party conference in Aberdeen shortly, will also accuse the UK government of denying Scottish democracy. We'll bring you that speech live on GB News in just about an hour's time. A former nurse has pleaded not guilty to the murders of multiple babies. Lucy Letby is accused of killing seven children and attempting to kill ten others between 2015 and 16. She was working at the Countess of Chester Hospital at the time of their deaths. The trial at Manchester Crown Court is expected to take up to six months. Criminal barristers in England and Wales have voted to end strike action after accepting a pay offer from the government. The offer from the Ministry of Justice includes reforms to set fees for legal aid work and an investment of £54 million in the criminal bar. Almost 57% voted to accept the deal. Strike action will end at 6 o'clock tonight. The chairman of the Criminal Bar Association, Kirsty Brimlow, told GB News, though, there's still a lot of anger amongst members. The offer really did hit the demands of the criminal bar. However, a number of barristers still consider that it hasn't gone far, far enough. There's still a lot of trust in government that has to be realised. And we hope that this is the start of a constructive arrangement. This is GB News. We'll bring you more as it happens. Now, back to Newsday with Mark and Gloria. Rosie, thanks very much indeed. So, uh, as we were hearing in the news there, Russian missiles have hit major Ukrainian cities, including the capital Kyiv, killing at least 10 people and injuring 60 more. Air raid sirens are actually going off in the capital Kyiv as we speak. Russia has fired 83 missiles at civilian targets across Ukraine and it's just been reported that one of the missiles hit the German consulate visa office in Ukraine, but it was not in use when it struck. Well, NATO's chief Jens Stoltenberg has condemned Russia's horrific and indiscriminate attacks in Ukraine, as he called them. Meanwhile, China is also calling now for de-escalation. The attacks have come after the only bridge that connects Russia to Crimea partially exploded on Saturday morning. Ukraine has not so far admitted any responsibility for the explosion. Well, President Putin was speaking earlier, confirming those strikes and uh, saying there will be a harsh response to any further attacks on what he called Russian territory. And the leader of Belarus, Alexander Lukashenko, has uh, stated too that Be uh, Belarus and Russia are now to form a joint military group, saying that his country was under threat from NATO, but uh, without giving any further details. Let's take a look at where some of the explosions have hit in Ukraine now. As you can see, some of the cities that have been hit include Ternopil, and Lviv in the west of Ukraine and Dnipro, which is in the south of Ukraine. There have also been missile strikes in the capital, Kyiv. Let's speak now to Keir Giles, who's a senior consulting fellow uh, for the Russian Eurasia programme at Chatham House. Thank you very much uh, indeed for uh, talking to us, Keir. As we were saying, uh, I gather that the um, alarms, the um, air raid sirens are going off in Kyiv once more. Um, this does appear to be uh, Russia returning to a previous tactic of using these long range missiles to hit civilian areas. That's right. That tactic never really went away. Russia has always been trying to hammer civilian areas in Ukraine, but it hasn't been seen at this kind of intensity since the early weeks of the war. And it does seem to be a deliberate response by Russia to try to destroy what it can. This it seems to be the attitude that if they can't defeat Ukraine by military means, if they can't have Ukraine, nobody else can. So they will be trying to cause as much destruction and misery across the country as they're able to. And there are two separate uh, programs 
programs here. They're two separate uh, patterns of attacks. We're seeing a lot of pictures and video of attacks in populated areas in the cities because that's where people are. But the other thing that's happening at the same time is targeting Ukraine's energy infrastructure, trying to make sure that Ukraine doesn't have power. And we're already hearing about uh, the start of rolling blackouts of power in major populated areas as a result. Our Prime Minister Liz Truss will meet with fellow leaders of the G7 tomorrow. They'll have crisis talks on the situation in Ukraine. What needs to come out to emerge from those talks? Well, first of all, we're already hearing a lot of messages from around the world condemning these Russian attacks quite rightly. What we're not hearing so much of is additional help to Ukraine to actually defend itself against these genocidal assaults from Russia. Ukraine's been asking for a long time for advanced air defenses so that it can protect its cities against missile attacks like this. And for all the gratitude that Ukraine has been showing so far, they're also pointing out that that hasn't been received. And that leaves civilians, ordinary people, when women and children across Ukraine vulnerable to this kind of indiscriminate attack. And would that be a, a major calculation for all powers in that obviously if you do uh, start putting more aircraft into the sky, you try and hit the uh, site of the, the missiles being fired, you could actually encroach on Russian territory proper. And that obviously then changes all the, the various uh, calculations that Putin would make himself. Well, nobody is yet talking publicly about uh, that kind of strike against Russia's own assets by aircraft that aren't Ukrainians. What they're asking for instead is air defenses. It's something that can actually protect against the missiles that are coming in, against uh, all of the rocket attacks that we've seen since the very early stages of this conflict. Now, we did, at the very early time of this uh, of this war, hear calls for a no-fly zone over, the, over Ukraine, where Western allies and partners of Ukraine would be able to protect protect its airspace. That I think we'll hear more of again, trying to defend those Ukrainian populated areas against Russia. And the attacks that we're seeing, that we're discussing now, they are in response to the attack on the Crimea bridge. Just tell us why this is such an important bridge for President Putin. Well, first of all, it's worth mentioning that uh, Putin has not only pointed to the attack on the Kerch Bridge to Crimea as a cause for this stepping up the attacks on civilians in Ukraine. He's also saying that Ukraine's been carrying out a number of other attack attacks, some of which seem quite implausible, like bombing the gas pipeline to Turkey and carrying out an attack on a Russian nuclear power station. But in any case, yes, we were expecting that there would be some kind of response, and we were waiting to see what it was after Ukraine struck at this highly symbolic target, which not only has a military impact on Russia being able to deliver troops and equipment to Crimea, but also strikes at the symbolic nature of Russia's seizure of Crimea. This was the, the great Russian triumph where it connected Crimea to the Russian mainland. And striking at that, of course, sends a message across Russia. And what will that humiliation be doing for Putin's position? He's been speaking today in St. Petersburg, but we, we do understand that there are increasing voices in the Kremlin questioning this whole approach. That's right. The criticism of President Putin has become, been becoming even more vocal, and the criticism of his generals and the conduct of the war has now become really quite shrill. Putin did have to respond with some show of force, because otherwise it would be a demonstration of weakness and an admission of defeat in this war. The problem for Putin, of course, is that the reality gap between how this war has been sold to the Russian population and the evidence that they cannot deny is getting wider and wider all the time. And that, of course, puts a lot of strain on how Putin can manage this war. Keir Giles, Senior Consulting Fellow, Russia and Eurasia Programme at Chatham House. It's a long title. Thank you very much indeed for your expertise and wisdom. Thank you. Important title. Thank you, Thank you very much indeed. Uh, well, here the Chancellor Kwasi Kwarteng bowing to pressure, it seems, by bringing forward the publication of his tax plans and economic forecast now to October the 31st. Halloween, by the way. And this latest U-turn has gone down well with some Conservative MPs, like the chairman of the Treasury Select Committee, Mel Stride, tweeting this morning that he strongly welcomed this decision. But remember this, less than a week ago, the Chancellor insisted he would not change that date in the exclusive interview he gave to us at the Conservative Party conference. You are going to bring forward the fiscal assessment uh, in conjunction with the Office of Budget Responsibility. Said you that. said in your speech yesterday 
that will happen shortly is shortly before the 23rd. So shortly is the 23rd. I mean, uh, people reading the runes and parsing. So it is going to be the 23rd of November. The, 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 you're, the, you're not bringing that fiscal it's, it's, plan it's going to be, forward. It, it's going to be the 23rd of November. Okay. Let's turn to uh, economics and business editor Liam Halgan, who carried out that interview with On The Money. Uh, what a difference a week makes. Uh, there he was, sticking to his guns. Uh, it was November, now he's brought it forward. And also, we're going to get the OBR running their, their slide rule over the figures. Indeed, Mark. To a lot of people listening, watching GB News, this sounds very process-driven. This sounds like the mechanics of politics rather than the outcomes and what it means for them. But this kind of stuff can impact financial markets. It can impact, in particular, what we call the 10-year gilt market. That's where the government sells its debt. It's that market price, rather than the Bank of England's uh, interest rates, which set the benchmark for mortgages, personal loans. Those, they ripple out across the economy. That's where big investors, pension funds, insurance companies, they have to buy this government debt. The regulators say they must because it's meant to be the safest asset. And what we're seeing today, Mark, when I came on earlier, I said the, the, the gilt yields, the borrowing costs in the market were quite stable. They have actually spiked up a little bit oh, like really? in the last hour or so. So they're now up at about 4.4%. And that's why mortgage rates that are quoted are up to sort of 55 to 6%, because mm. that's the margin that the banks, the building societies, the other mortgage lenders yep. actually make. But what's interesting at the same time is that this is part of a long-term trend. The market seems to have stabilised and the trend is going up a bit, as I've often said, uh, it would. It's just a long-term global trend. The pound is quite stable. So a lot of the mortgage deals that were withdrawn in the aftermath of this mini-budget, and many broadcasters were saying, oh, my God, the whole mortgage market's melting down. A lot of those deals have now come back because there is a sense that there's a bit more stability. Having said that, for the Chancellor and the Prime Minister to change their mind again on this important financial statement, it's not so much a U-turn. I mean, they've gone all the way round... 360. It's, not, it's, it's yeah. more than 360. Yeah. It's 540, as old-time <laughs> skateboarders <laughs> listening to GB News and watching GB News will remember. They have literally gone all the way round and then round back. Yeah. To, so it is quite strange. And I wonder, I wonder, you know, I've known the Prime Minister and the Chancellor for some time as MPs and so on. They are, you know, ideologically close. They came into the Commons at the same time. They've written books and pamphlets together. They do have really good personal relations, and we all know how important that is at the top of government. Signs of little chinks, mm. cracks in their relationship at the moment. And just to stick um, with the politics, but also how it relates to real life. So we spoke to a Conservative MP today on the programme and um, a sh Shadow Secretary of State at two, and both of them said in separate interviews that the reason why they felt the poll re lead, or the poll demise, <laughs> for uh, the government uh, was taking place was because what was happening to mortgage rates. Now, whenever you see Listras or Kwasi Kwarteng asked about mortgage rates, they say this is a matter for the Bank of England, no to do with mm -hmm. us. The politics of that suggests different. I think what really spooks people is when um, you know, the media understandably reports the fact that the pound has fallen a lot and reports the fact that borrowing costs have spiked up. Yeah, but mortgages are different because we're talking four million people here. Absolutely, and this is what drives mortgage rates. Uh, and, you know, that is... It, it was sparked by the mini-budget, this, this uptick in borrowing costs, mm -hmm. but it was going to happen anyway. And I think the government has to do better at explaining that. They need to talk about this long-term global interest rate trends as we're moving away from those ultra-low interest rates that we've had since the global financial crisis. I do think ministers have been more than a bit flat-footed in terms of getting ahead of this argument. They should have been saying a long time ago, look, interest rates inevitably are going to go up. But they seem to have been... You it, can't explain that, because people are in pain. No, sure. Yeah, it, it is. It is there's it no is, amount it, of explanation. It, it is pain, that and it's, al it's almost inevitable that, that politicians will get the blame for it. But that's why they have to demonstrate this is a global phenomenon. Yeah. And actually, you know, mortgage holders won't like me saying this, but for every mortgage holder, there's a saver. And it actually, makes, it yeah. actually makes sense for a lot of people to see interest rates go up.
Talking of stresses and strains, there is another sort of fault line that's between the government and the Bank of England, it seems. The bank stepped in with, what, 65 billion, it said, outlined to buy these gilts to try and support the market, because we had that meltdown where they were indicating that, you know, part of the pensions industry nearly collapsed, the defined benefit, the, the final salaries, relying on these bonds and gilts. Where are we at the moment with that buying programme and, and what's being done to support that market? Well, the market seems quite well supported at the moment and, and what central banking is often about, it's about baring your teeth rather than mm. actually lunging and, and biting mm. the, the market and pushing the speculators back, if you like. Out of that £65 billion that the Bank of England announced would be available to support the gilts market, it's spent so far about three or four billion. Is that all? So it's not, not oh. a figure you hear often on, on, <laughs> Only on, three billion, on mainstream yeah. television. Um, <laughs> But that is, that is the, the long and the short of it. I think for now, the gilts market looks relatively well supported. I think for now, there's not going to be another big spike in borrowing costs. Having said that, the more there is a sense that the government hasn't got grip, the more they keep moving the dates around of these important mm. announcements, the more there's a sense that there's actually you know, a bit of a rift between the Prime Minister and the Chancellor here. And this is really sort of inside Westminster stuff, but... The Chancellor's choice for permanent secretary at the Treasury, a crucial role after he sacked the former permanent secretary, seems to have been overruled by the Prime Minister uh, this morning and this afternoon. That won't mean a lot to ordinary people, but the markets will be watching closely and it does give a bit more of a sense that the government is not singing from one hymn sheet when it become, comes to this really important issue of managing the economy. Strange times, eh? Thank you very much for that. More, of course, as we get it, to see how the markets are reacting to everything as well. Well, moving on, Prime Minister Liz Truss is launching a charm <laughs> offensive to bring MPs in her party together after division in her party uh, was aroused by whether or not she would bring benefits in line with prices. Well, it's all a part of an effort by Downing Street, it seems, to uh, stem further discontent within the party onto whether to raise those benefits in line with inflation or the lower measure, that is average pay. Well, Conservative MP Nigel Mill spoke to us earlier. We asked him if he believed the government had to raise those benefits with inflation. I mean, they've... Uh... I mean, the idea of benefits is that we give people a certain decent standard of living and for that to uh, continue, the money that you give them has to go up with the... Uh, in line with the cost of what they buy with that money. So inflation is the right way to increase benefits, especially in a, a crisis like this. You, you know, the idea that people can live for the year from April 23 through to the end of March 24 uh, on less than an inflationary increase in this situation, I think it's just completely impossible. I can see why you, you know, simplistically, you might think, well, why put benefits up by a higher rate than earnings? Won't that stop people wanting to go to work and make benefits, you know, worth more than, than working but when you really think it through the, you, you know, the idea with bills rising as they are that people can actually manage on five percent less in real terms than they are now to get through the whole of the winter 23 24 is just impossible I, I, I actually think the real question is will we have to repeat all the help we've given people this year to get through the next winter i think that's a much more live debate than this one which i think will be resolved pretty quickly in the right way uh, we're told that Liz Truss is going to embark on a charm offensive. How does she do that? Well, I think it makes sense. You know, she's only been in, in post a month or so. Uh, Parliament's back this week. MPs will be there. She can she can meet us and explain what the government's plans are and how they're going to, you know, hopefully not make the same mistakes in the coming weeks that they've made in the uh, first few of her of her reign. I mean, there have been some. Yeah, quite right decisions. I mean, the huge energy support was much more generous than most people expected. That you know, as a, perhaps a hundred billion worth of announcement that appears to have got lost. Uh, so it hasn't all been bad, but I think there's a need just to, to get a grip and reassure people. And I hope that's what we get this week. And that was Nigel Mills, the Conservative MP, speaking to us a little earlier in the programme. We can now speak to GB News political reporter Catherine Forster. So lots of MPs, lots of Conservative MPs, want benefits to rise in line with prices, that's the higher amount. Are they going to get their way? I'm going to do something very dangerous and make a prediction. I think they are. I, I think there is a zero chance that Liz Truss will be able to hold to what is reported to be her wish to keep them in term down to real earnings. So um, save five billion or so. Mm. I don't think the numbers are there, apparently. I mean, 
We've heard from many, even in the Cabinet, like Penny Morden last week at conference, even people like Jacob Rees-Mogg, that at Cabinet tomorrow uh, they're going to make it clear to her that uh, she's not going to get this through. Now, the government... Liz Truss's team very keen to say absolutely no decision has been made. Chloe Smith, Secretary of State for Work and Pensions, there's a process that has to be followed. They're still looking at the numbers. They haven't got all the data. But it seems clear that Liz Truss would have liked to have saved five or six billion. But politically, I suspect that's going to be impossible or they will have to raise it by the level of inflation. Right. And, and very quickly, this is because Parliament's coming back. The Whip's obviously been speaking to MPs. They've been trying to get the temperature of the party. And it's, it's not looking good for them. Yes. And, I mean, this row basically uh, came to life as soon as Liz Truss U-turned on the top rate of tax. They went on to the next thing that they didn't like, which right. was this. Yeah. So this has been rumbling on for a period of time now. So... Uh, Yes, and of course, the more this happens, the more the rebels, the people that are not happy with her, get the wind in their sails and think, OK, what else can we do? What else can we do? Yeah. So it's very difficult for her. Catherine, thanks very much indeed for that. Uh, now, let's just remind you that uh, we were updating you with the situation in Ukraine. We were hearing that the air raid sirens were uh, once again in Kyiv. Uh, the latest figures, we got 10 people killed, 60 injured in some 83 strikes by uh, Russian missiles across the country. Let's speak now to the former president of Ukraine, Petra Poroshenko, who joins us once more. Mr Poroshenko, thank you for joining us. So we had problems with the communications earlier, but um, just to explain where you are, you were telling us that one of these missile strikes has hit this area where you are with a children's playground behind you. Absolutely right, and this has happened just a couple of hours ago, and... It was a lots of children would go to the kindergarten and uh, we have just 200 meters from here another missiles coming on the uh, Vladimirsk and the Bulvar Shevchenko street. There is uh, no glass in the windows. There is uh, many cars which was burned and uh, you are absolutely right. Ten person is killed throughout Ukraine. More than 60 is uh, uh, wounded and uh, 11 objects of the critical energy uh, civilian in Russian too. Why Russia do that? Because he want to make us afraid. He want to disunite us. And Ukraine is demonstrated. We are unbreakable. We do not afraid Putin. We do not trust Putin. And we have the best, deep, and maybe, by the way, this is an important message, that this is the tactics of Putin to make a pressure uh, for uh, certain talks or capitulation on the Putin condition. And uh, with this position, this is the, just a demonstration that this is attack not only against Ukraine. This is attack against UK, against France, against US. This is an attack against the whole free world. And uh, this is attack, by the way, not only Russia. This is attack of Russia. Still a Russia from the territory of which we have uh, attack of Russian missiles. And Iran, who, because Putin now using it, Iranian drones with their long range, with their very heavy explosive, and uh, which killing Ukraine, which wounded Ukraine, which ruined Ukraine. And the uh, result is absolutely opposite. We are together, we are not afraid, we are full of decisiveness to throw Putin away from uh, the Ukrainian soil. And this is the evidence, Ukrainian people are unbreakable. And the international community have stood shoulder to shoulder with the Ukrainian people. Tomorrow, our Prime Minister, along with other G7 leaders, they will hold crisis talks on the situation in Ukraine. What do you want to hear from them? First of all, this is a, a very important message that the G7 nation should follow the example of the Baltic states and others and name Russia as a country-sponsored terrorist with the respective results on the international law. That should be a responsibility of Russia for such a state. Second position, today we have an extraordinary session of the United Nations General Assembly 
and we should launch the procedure to throw Russia away from the uh, United Nations, exactly the same like was done with the Soviet Union after aggression against Finland. And that definitely make it effective the Security Council of the United Nations. And point number three, the day after tomorrow, it would be special session of the Rammstein group, uh, so-called the uh, anti-Putin coalition of the world. And uh, with that uh, meeting, we expected that Ukraine receive anti-missile weapons who can protect Ukrainian uh, sky because we have a great and professional operator of this system. Ukraine should get the anti-drone weapons which should be uh, bought from US or from Israel, but definitely we should use the unique experience against Iran and Iranian drones to protect Ukraine. And we definitely should think about the possible deliver to Ukraine F-16. Yeah. And I'm happy that we have yes. a pilot train already. And, and Mr. Poroshenko, even without that equipment, I understand that your Air Force has been able to, to shoot down some of these missiles coming in. Yeah. I am proud that in the year 2014, I start to beat as a Supreme Commander-in-Chief Ukrainian Armed Forces. And we have a very special uh, anti-aircraft system, which uh, Russia cannot destroy it immediately. And with that situation, I want to use this opportunity to thank you to, for your uh, extremely great leadership in the world, together with the Americans. And we just now speak with the American ambassador who were together uh, here on the uh, site of the attack. And this leadership should definitely bring the peace to the uh, world. But this peace should be uh, the, uh, through the uh, victory on the crazy Putin. And how we can do that? Another thing, please do exactly the same like you do for Finland and Sweden. Please accept and give to Ukraine the full membership. That uh, message is extremely supportive from possibly tomorrow G7 meeting our membership in NATO. And in the next summit of NATO, next yeah. year in Vilnius, we keep fingers crossed that yeah. this can happen. Well, we'll see that what that meeting uh, comes up with uh, tomorrow, the G7. But uh, Petra Poroshenko, former president of Ukraine, thank you very much for speaking us, uh, to us here on GB Newsday. Our apologies for the breakup in the signal air, uh, earlier, but uh, for obvious reasons. Thank you very much indeed. The time is 2.32. Coming up, we'll be heading to the Scottish National Party conference. But before that, it is your news headlines. A very good afternoon to you. I'm Rosie Wright. It's 2.32. Let's get you up to date. G7 leaders will hold urgent talks tomorrow to discuss their response to the Russian airstrikes in Ukraine. Authorities say at least 11 people have been killed and 64 injured as explosions hit several cities, including the capital. The UK is keeping a close eye on what's being described as the increasingly reckless tactics by Russia, with the Foreign Secretary saying firing missiles into civilian areas is unacceptable. Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky says 11 important infrastructure facilities in Kyiv and eight regions have been damaged. President Vladimir Putin said it was right to retaliate after the Crimea blast. He's accused Ukraine of a targeted attack at the weekend when a truck exploded, damaging a bridge. Putin warned if attacks continue against Russia, the response will be harsh. Other news now, and the Chancellor has bowed to pressure to bring forward his much-anticipated medium-term fiscal plan. Last week, in an exclusive interview with us at GB News, Kwasi Kwarteng said he was going to stick to the original date in mid-November. Well, today, in a letter to the chairman of the Commons Treasury Committee, he says it will now be published on October the 31st. Scotland's First Minister is expected to tell SNP delegates that independence will lead to a better relationship between the UK's four nations. Nicola Surgeon, who's due to close the party conference very shortly in Aberdeen, will also accuse the UK government of denying Scottish democracy. Now, we'll bring you that speech live here on GB News in just about half an hour's time. The King has sent a message of condolence to the President of Ireland following the death of 10 people in Friday's petrol station in County Donegal. 
He said both he and the Queen Consort have been filled with immense sadness. They offered their heartfelt sympathy to those affected in what he described as a devastating tragedy. We're on your TV, online and DAB Plus Radio. This is GB News. Weekday afternoons on GB News, we've got the whole of the UK covered. From 12 to 3, it's GB News Day with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Gloria De Piero. You'll get the very latest on everything that's been going on across our great nation. And from 3 till 6, watch out for GB News Live with me, Patrick Christie's. I'm not here to mess around with all the biggest topics and guests. You will always be up to date. GB News Day and GB News Live from 12 p.m. Only on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB Plus Digital Radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm, where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee. But we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11pm. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11pm, seven nights a week. The time is 2.36, you're watching God, you've GB got good eyesight. I can hardly it's see that. It's nearly 2.37. Yeah. <laughs> Environmental protesters blocked the mall outside Buckingham Palace this morning. Around oh. 25 just stopped oil activists sat in the road and some of them glued their hands together in protest against new fossil fuel licences. Well, just learning that uh, police say they managed to clear the road in time for changing the guard uh, procession, but uh, have now just confirmed that they made 25 arrests after that uh, event. Well, it all comes after Animal Rebellion also held protests in central London at the weekend when they were calling for a plant-based future. We're joined now by Donna Her McCarthy, who's a climate columnist for The Independent. Donna Her, the protesters have a cause... But what about the means? Yeah, well, I think the real problem here is that there's not enough protesters on the street in the light of what's happening. You know, we've got millions of people across Britain now suffering because of the failure of government to invest in insulation and renewables. And the idea that actually disrupting one junction, one junction in a city of 9 million with 11,000 junctions is a price too high to pay, to call attention to the incredible impacts that the failure of government policy is implementing on British people is it, just it's, it's not it's not it's not fair in my view. And in, in terms of how they're carrying this about, it does seem to be achieving its end, and that we're all talking about it. Even though when you look at what happened in the Mall this morning, it's actually quite a limited number, only twenty-five people. Yeah. The the, the protests over the last three years have very successfully persuaded and got the attention of the British people on the serious issues that are, are facing us. Large amounts of, of the public now support action on climate. They support solar panels. They support insulation. They oppose fracking. They oppose North Sea oil and they oppose the expansion of our roads network. So therefore, the, the protests have achieved that, that target. What they haven't achieved is that we've now got a government going in the opposite direction of what the British public wants, which is investment in, in insulation and renewables. So unfortunately, until such time as we have a government reflecting what the people want, it's my view that these protests will continue, if not escalate. 
And when we spoke to a protester um, earlier in the show, they said they'd tried sort of nicey-nicey, the more conventional routes of lobbying, like going to see their MP or signing petitions, but that no one was listening. So they have no choice but to engage in these tactics. Is that really justified, though? Well, it's true. If you look at that, what happened until the one of the groups that the Prime Minister rightly referred to, these vested interests posing as think tanks, lobbied the Daily Mail to rage a war on the green crap. Excuse my French, that was the phrase they used in the Daily, in Daily Mail. And as a result of that, the government cut, abolished the programme of investing in insulation for poor people's homes. We were insulating two and a half million homes a year. Can you imagine if we hadn't done that, what situation we would now be in? 16 million families would now be in a situation where they wouldn't be facing horrific rises in electricity and gas prices. So what happened was we lobbied, they voted, they, they marched, they did peaceful marches, and what happened? Nothing. Nobody talked about it. And we've now got millions of people facing a really, really terrible winter where they're facing a choice between food and heat. And that's directly because the government didn't listen. Well, should these things go, as we were saying, animal rebellion at the weekend, <laughs> pouring milk on the floor at Fortnum and Masons. I mean, there may be some people out there thinking, well, actually, that's a bit childish. Well, you know, the the idea that you spill a bottle of milk to, to save the millions of pounds that's being wasted on, on the elderly, it's, it's a tactic. I mean, in, in history, protesters have to resort to I think what they were saying was, was that they wanted a, a plant-based future. And, you know, there may be lots of people thinking, well, actually, I quite like dairy products, I like drinking cow's milk. And to, to go to those lengths, maybe they are actually just pushing it a bit too far. Well, I think the, the tactic of spilling a bottle of milk, so long as it, it's, it's done safely, is not in, term, in terms of uh, violent, it's not a violent act. However, the actual, the issue of... of, of of um, the amount of meat we eat and the amount of dairy we consume is a really important one. It's one of the largest source of carbon emissions in the world. It's driving the destruction of the rainforest. It's actually it's driving the genocide of indigenous people because we're using the soya beans from the Amazon to feed our dairy and, and um, beef herds. And so there's a direct link there. So they're right to bring attention to it. If people switch to a more plant-based diet, so we eat meat maybe once a week, we will make a huge step in the right direction. Just looking at their Twitter feed this morning, Just Stop Oil wrote, this is the moment to come together and resist. We're going to stop new oil, whether those in power agree or not. We are not asking, we're going to make it happen. We've got a democratic, democratically elected government. These people weren't elected yeah. by anybody. That, that's true. And that's been always true of every single protester in history. However, if you will look at the current government, their manifesto said that they would um, expand uh, insulation. They said they would oppose fracking. They said they would move onwards to net zero. We've now got a government without any election, no mandate, who are implementing the policies opposite from their own manifesto. That's a real democratic outrage in a supposed democracy. So you're right to raise the issue of democracy. Protesters have never had the legitimacy of election, but they have had the legitimacy of peaceful, direct protest. And that is, they're a proud tradition going back hundreds of years in the UK. We need an election to justify where we go forward. You're right to bring up the issue of, of, of the lack of an electoral mandate, because the current trust government does not have a mandate for what they're doing. It wasn't in their manifesto. They're doing the opposite. Of it. So if trust has the right I can hear you, and, yeah. and, and to go yeah. and have a general election, can't do it for, for okay, Donaher, uh, thank you very much. We're getting a bit of interference on the sound there. Whether it's a protester or not, I don't know. But anyway, thank you very much indeed for bringing us your views and uh, joining us on GB News Day once more. Thank you, Donaher McCarthy there from The Independent. Now we are going to cross to Aberdeen because in about half an hour's time, Nicol, Nicola Sturgeon, the First Minister, will address delegates at Scottish the SNP conference. She's expected to say that Scottish independence will create a partnership of equals in the UK. Well, the First Minister is setting out a very specific date. Uh, she'd like uh, Indy Ref 2, as it's been snappily called, on the 19th of October 2023. But it's now up to the UK Supreme Court to decide whether, indeed, she has the legal powers to press ahead with that vote. And just to remind you, you can watch the speech live here at 3.15. But first, GB News political editor Darren McCaffrey joining us in Aberdeen. And, uh, Darren, obviously it's going to be a bit of a legal tussle in terms of the Supreme Court, but she's going to, I guess, set her stall out once more at Aberdeen this afternoon. 
Yeah, indeed. The fundamental argument from the SNP is that they have been elected successively here in Scotland for the last decade or so. They won the Hollywood elections last year. There is a majority of MSPs in favour of a second independence referendum and that in a democratic society they should be allowed to hold one. However, constitutionally, the Hollywood Parliament, the Scottish Parliament, does not have the right uh, to essentially sanction a second referendum. At the moment, it is the prerogative of Parliament of Westminster. That seems to be the constitutional settlement. As you say, though, Nicola Sturgeon is going to the Supreme Court, those hearings start tomorrow, uh, to decide who does have that uh, right, that legitimacy to sanction a second referendum. Is it MSPs in Edinburgh or is it MPs in Westminster? The problem is, if it is MPs in Westminster, the Prime Minister has made it clear, she's got a majority of, what, 70-odd MPs, uh, that she is not prepared to allow any referendum any time soon. And so there is a sense of frustration inside the SNP, undoubtedly, and Nicola Sturgeon's going to express that in her speech, as you say, within the next 30 minutes or so. And she's going to talk about how um, the undecided voters, uh, when it comes to Scottish independence, is the only way to protect the partnership with the UK, and what she says, in the face of aggressive unionism, from the Trust Government. But it's not just all going to be about independence. Uh, we are going to learn a bit more, I think, about how the Scottish Government itself plans to tackle the cost of living crisis this coming winter and the months ahead. Uh, we know there's going to be a preview of the arguments around the Scottish Government's economic paper that she's going to set out a little bit, gives a little bit of ankle in what's that going to be in that. And also talk about renewable energy and energy security. The argument, of course, from Scotland is that they're in a pretty good position when it comes to energy security, that, frankly, they are going to spend an awful lot of money investing in wind farms. This is the windiest part of Europe, and that that will pay dividends in the years and years uh, to come. So we're going to get a pretty broad speech, I would suggest, touching on lots and lots of issues, and there will be the usual political attacks, as one would expect in any party leader's speech, most notably against the Conservative Party. She used pretty spicy language over the weekend, language that many felt went too far when she talked about how she detested the Tories and their policies. But also, I think, interesting, Mark, there will be attacks on Labour too. And why is that? Well, Labour has started to tick up quite substantially in the polls here in Scotland in recent days and weeks reflecting somewhat the national picture, you may well say. Now, when you look at those polls, they do seem to be taking most of the votes away from the Conservative Party, but I think there is concern in the SNP that a resurgent Labour in Scotland could be somewhat of a threat to them as well. Yes, and just referring to that language that uh, she's got quite a bit of flack for, uh, used over the weekend, she said, I detest the Tories and everything they stand for. Um, Keir Starmer, the Labour leader, was asked about that and said he wouldn't use that language. But she really has got some, had some stick, hasn't she, over the tone of her remarks about the Tories. Yeah, I mean, lots of politicians, lots of Conservative politicians. I think Nadim Zahari said you know, this is not the language to be used in politics, that it could be proved to be quite dangerous, that using words like detest and hate is quite strong, even against your political opponents. You know, Nicola Sturgeon's argument is, first of all, rowing back a little bit, suggesting that this wasn't aimed at anyone specifically who is a Conservative or a voted uh, Conservative. This is rather against the policies, and also that it shouldn't come as a surprise that she's not a big fan of the Conservative Party, uh, given the fact that she's the leader of the SNP and has been campaigning against them for many uh, decades. You know, it's all these things, whereas the line in politics, it's not necessarily always terribly clear. Sometimes passions do run high. Sometimes people say things probably in the heat of the moment or in an interview that maybe they felt went a little too far. But in the end, politics is also a bit of a brutal game. It is a combat, combat sport. Uh, it is one, as I say, where people feel very passionate about things, irrespective of what side of the debate you're on. Uh, and in many ways, the language yeah. reflects that. So all in all, I mean, I think, frankly, in the grand scheme of things, it's a little bit of a storm in a teacup. Um, I think there are much bigger kind of political issues to talk yeah. about. And I, I think Nicola Sturgeon referred to this somewhat yesterday, Mark, when she said, in the end, if that's the story you come out of this conference, maybe it's a sign that the conference is altogether a little bit boring, as it's yeah. all terribly sensible, and they've got <laughs> quite a lot of control over the party well, and discipline uh, amongst uh, the members as well. Yeah, I was, I was going to ask you about that. We've just seen some pictures of um, Nicola Sturgeon in a hard hat, uh, as, of course, we saw Liz Truss. Uh, it may be that, actually, Nicola Sturgeon doesn't need quite so much use of it. She is really in total control of this party, as compared to the chaos and confusion that we saw in Birmingham. Yeah, I mean, you could not get a 
more contrast in terms of the party conferences that I've been over to the last couple of weeks. You know, Labour was pretty disciplined in Liverpool. Uh, the Conservatives possibly had the worst party conference in decades in terms of just <laughs> U-turns, infighting, cabinet splits, uh, backbiting amongst the few MPs who were there. I mean, it was really quite extraordinary. Here, it's been pretty well-oiled, pretty disciplined. I mean, they did have a bit of a ride back, remember, in 2019, when they last met in, met in person, when Alex Salmon essentially was getting kicked out of the party and some MPs didn't like that, and there was a little bit of speech, and the Alba party, which is also a pro-independence party, uh, was set up. Uh, but this year, it is all uh, pretty disciplined. Nicola Sturgeon herself, you know, frankly, she's the most successful politician on these islands. Um, and she remains incredibly popular in Scotland. I mean, that is the most extraordinary thing, I think, you know, to take away from all of this. Again, whether you're a supporter of the SNP or not, the very fact that they have continually won elections here quite substantially for the best part of 10, 15 years is quite extraordinary. Indeed. Darren, thanks very much indeed. Of course, that speech coming up live, 3.15 here on GB News. Now, disturbing new statistics compiled by a mental health charity show rising numbers of nurses, doctors, paramedics, midwives, police officers and firefighters are now seeking help with their mental health. We're joined now by Liam Barnes, chair of the Laura Hyde Foundation, a mental health charity for emergency service uh, workers. Liam, thanks very much for speaking to us. Uh, is this uh, largely uh, the result of post-traumatic stress uh, conditions that people have when they're having to deal with these emergency situations, help people, and then uh, afterwards they, they have to come to, to terms with it all? I think that's certainly a factor. Um, I mean, they're incredibly stressful positions of work. They see things that the general public don't normally see. Um, but there are other factors as well. We've got a culture, certainly in the NHS, where there is a, a fear of putting their head above the parapet a little bit. There's a fear of uh, letting colleagues down. There's almost some bullying culture in there as well, which often uh, creates a, a very alone um, situation for people. And then you've got the cost of living crisis growing for a, a role that is not particularly greatly paid. It doesn't have the greatest work-life balance as well. It's all really starting to become a little bit of a perfect storm and, uh, and that's causing a huge strain on those frontline staff. In memory of the Navy nurse, Laura Hyde, just tell us about Laura. Well, Laura was essentially the perfect nurse. She's incredibly selfless. Um, she was uh, always the life and soul of the party. If you've ever watched the TV sitcom Friends, she, there was a, a character called Janice that had that annoying laugh. That was what Laura uh, had that you could hear across the other side of the hospital. But essentially, she didn't look after her own mental health. She put others in front of herself. And um, on, the, on the back of really work pressures, uh, a fear of, that she was uh, not uh, letting... Um, colleagues down by not necessarily performing at the top top level every single time and fear of letting patients down and the, and the public that she supported um, she she felt that suicide was the only way out and and, and that's certainly something at the Laura Hyde Foundation we're looking to change um, suicide should never ever be the only option for someone in their mental health at all um, there are many many ways that people can uh, provide intervention support there are many many ways that people can provide proactive support within there and that responsibility sits with politicians it sits with management within the NHS but it also sits with the individual themselves um, but the stigma that stops people going to get that support is rife within the public sector. And that's uh, the, what we're trying to do with the Laura Hyde Foundation. And today um, we launched a video on, on the back of World Mental Health Day called The Feelings. It's an animation video. We, we feel that it's so creative in the way that it's uh, constructed that it will go and help people that maybe we found a little bit more difficult to go and sort of penetrate with the, with the support offers that we have. Um, so we're very, very excited about that. And we're already seeing some massive results. And, and Liam, it, it may be that many of us just thought that all these emergency uh, services had counselling uh, already set up to help people uh, uh, and to, to talk through the various problems. That's not necessarily the case then? Uh, no, it's not always the case. I also feel that, um, you know, we did a proprietary piece of research uh, back in 2021 that asked uh, about 1,300 NHS workers, would they ever take up an employee-based service? Give, you know, it could be the, the gold standard. It could be the greatest thing out there. But over 53% said they would never take it up because they don't want to have the fear of being struck off. They don't want to have the fear of... Uh, being seen by their colleagues walking into the problem room. Um, they don't want to fear that they've made the wrong uh, 
decision by going um, into a job that's affecting their own personal life. It's it's many, many different combinations. So yes, there's not enough counselling or support, absolutely. But there's also um, a massive um, stigma of take up. Really interesting uh, research. Um, thank you for telling us about Laura Hyde, the Laura Hyde Foundation and the work that you're doing on Will's Mental Health Day. Thank you. Thank you, Liam Barnes. Thank you, guys. Bye. Thank you very much indeed for your time. Yes, uh, uh, a problem, of course, across all those emergency uh, workers, and we wish them well. Now, lots of you have been uh, getting in touch with us, tweeting, emailing. On the environmental protest, Margaret says, these protesters don't seem to be in work. I hope they're claiming benefits. Uh, ironic, maybe, I think. Uh, on Ukraine, Michael, I'm at a loss to understand why Ukraine's war is continuing in the way it is. The UK is hemorrhaging money and military supplies to them. We are not a bottomless pit. Uh, again, on the protest, Audrey has been in touch. What a cop-out. These vandals are causing mayhem on our roads and getting away with it. This is dangerous and they're breaking the law. If the police don't clear them, the public will. Uh, on the SNP, and we'll be heading to Aberdeen in a moment to hear that speech, Roger says, the SNP obviously do not like us. This goes back centuries. I don't think the SNP have been going centuries. Anyway, we should let the leave so we don't have to constantly hear about their endless moaning and campaigning. Close quotes. Oh, that's all we've got time for today. Glad to get it off your chest for you. Uh, GB Views at GB News and uh, more to come, of course, as you said, from Aberdeen. Yes, and we do really love hearing from you and thank you for your company today. Of course, we'll be back between midday and three tomorrow. Up next, it's Patrick Christie's with GB News Live. Before that, it is your weather. See you tomorrow. Hi there, I'm Ada McGiven from the Met Office. It's turned into a fine afternoon for many places. Sunny spells across a large part of the UK, but some showers have continued, especially towards the northwest of Scotland. That's because we've still got this area of low pressure to the north, and that's driving some unsettled weather into the north and west of Scotland, parts of Northern Ireland, northwest England as well. But elsewhere, a ridge of high pressure means that it's been a clear afternoon, and we keep the clear skies across England and Wales overnight with light winds as well. With those clear skies and with light winds, one or two mist and fog patches couldn't be ruled out. And actually temperatures will fall away. It's looking like a chilly night in places, especially through central parts of England and Wales in some shelter spots. One or zero Celsius possible first thing. Not so cold for northern and western Scotland. Here, thicker cloud and seven or eight Celsius more likely with showers continuing overnight and into the start of Tuesday. Now, the showers in Western Scotland will be replaced by more prolonged spells of rain into Tuesday afternoon, and that rain just brush brushing the far north of Northern Ireland. A few more showers to come for Southern Scotland and Northern England, but otherwise, for the southern half of the UK, sunny spells once again. And with light winds, 16 Celsius in the south will feel quite pleasant. 13 or 14 for Scotland and Northern Ireland. Now, as we end Tuesday, we'll see more prolonged and some heavier bursts of rain coming along into Northern Ireland, much of Scotland, as well as Northern England and North Wales. The rain on and off, I think, in many places, it's going to be most persistent towards the far northwest. And to the southeast, well, here we keep the clear spells and it'll be another chilly night with temperatures mid to low single figures in places. But a bright start to the day for the Midlands, East Anglia, the southeast. I think we keep the bright skies here for much of Wednesday, but elsewhere we'll see this band of rain toppling south into northern England, eventually North Midlands and North Wales. It will eventually peter out, but more unsettled weather on the way for Thursday and Friday. Weekday afternoons on GB News, we've got the whole of the UK covered. From 12 to 3, it's GB News Day with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Gloria De Piero. You'll get the very latest on everything that's been going on across our great nation. And from 3 till 6, watch out for GB News Live with me, Patrick Christie's. I'm not here to mess around with all the biggest topics and guests. You will always be up to date. GB News Day and GB News Live from 12 p.m. Only on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News.